So, Galen, the people have spoken. And what have they said? I have been too mean to you. Though you deserve it. I I mean, I agree with you, but I have been saying that for more, longer than we've been doing this podcast. Now, you've known me for many near... <laughs> I've been li- now, I've been knowing you for many years. Many near automatas. <laughs> You've known me for many years. More than half of our lives. So knowing me all these years, if you were given the ability to be mean to me, to just like straight up torture me, put me in a nightmare scenario, what would it be? Ooh, you're giving me this power? Hmm. I would Basically, I would put you in the middle of an anime convention of an anime you've never seen, but is very popular. Uh Uh-huh. And no, I know you, and I know that that would just drive you crazy having to be around that kind of a fan base of opinionated fanboys. That is the ultimate torture that I can think of for you. I think we can do better. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, well, let's switch tables on this. What what would your torture for me be to <laughs> make up for all of the years that I have been giving you the cringiest of dad jokes? Okay, so definitely, definitely. It is a tiny plane, a very small plane, and everybody on the plane is like a businessman or a businesswoman, and... They're all short, and they're all fine with this tiny plane. You're trying to squeeze past people, your butt is bouncing into people as you're trying to get to your seat, and your bag is hitting them, and they're all getting, like, upset at you. And then you get to your seat, and not only is it too tiny to fit just you, somebody else is sitting in it, and you have to say something to them about it, and there's people that you're holding up the line, and everybody's getting upset at you like it's your fault. I I gotta be honest, that's literally just me every time I fly in a plane. I mean, what else you got? (laughs) Have you built up a resistance? Is this actually my plan backfiring on me? That you've built up a resistance from me doing all this damage to you? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Is this Final Fantasy 2? I'm not doing this podcast with you. You're doing this podcast with me. Hello, my beautiful Materia. Friends, thank you for joining us today on the Nintendo Everything Podcast, episode 70. My mm-hmm. name is Oni Dino, and with me I have the stand-in for Kate Sith's Mog, just with more fur. It's Galen. You know what? I would be objection or objecting to this, but the royalties alone are going to set me up for life, so I can't complain too much. Also, Acura. Mm-hmm. Vroom, vroom. (laughs) No, what? Oh, God. So we're going to be talking about Final Fantasy VII in this episode. That's right. The remake demo came out earlier this week. What else is happening this week? Not a whole lot of news. Not a whole lot of news, honestly. (laughs) And uh, lots of game talk, of course. We have, however, a very special guest with us this week. We have His Royal Majesty, Barry from the Nintendo Fuse podcast. Barry, how are you doing? I'm doing great, and I, I love that suddenly I'm become royalty. I mean, wow, this is just really nice. Well, honestly, among the, this crowd of jesters and jokers, you're uh, easily royalty. Oh. You know, I, I, I like to think that we're giving you the Sonic the Movie treatment, because when you're here, you're family. Hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Galen, you're what the have one I that's seen this on. movie. I, I'm, I seeing, I'm seeing it next week, so no spoilers. I'm seeing it next week. Oh, okay. I got my tickets purchased and everything. <laughs> no spoilers, but it actually was a very entertaining movie. Um, I would not go see it again, but I don't regret seeing it the first time. Hmm. Something to look forward to. You need more shame in your in your mid-30s, Galen, I think. Um, I'm a mid-30-year-old white man. I've got plenty of shame. <laughs> <laughs> No. We don't all have shame. Some of <laughs> us are just happy. <laughs> oh, see, that's it. That's the positivity we're looking for. See, so Barry's going to fit in just perfectly in this in this group. Nice, nice. You got to have a positive outlook. Life is too crazy as is. It's too short. And people right now are freaking taking Purell and 
making it a black market item. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody is like yeah. Danny DeVito in that episode of It's Always Sunny where he covers himself in Purell and he shaves his, his entire body of hair and he's like rolling around on the ground like he just like came out of like a birthing sack <laughs> and he's like, I just need to be pure. I haven't seen this episode, but I can visualize it, and that worries me because that's that goes beyond just seeing it. It's now in my mind. Good. That's actually <laughs> what I was trying to do, being descriptive. I wonder how many listeners are going to be YouTubing that clip. Please do. It's the about. best. <laughs> so, Barry, I'm sorry. I'm cutting into this, but please <laughs> tell people a little bit about who you are, what you do, all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh... I've been a video game analyst and industry analyst for a long time now and an avid collector my whole life. Um, Nintendo obviously being uh, my number one uh, passion in, in terms of gaming. And for the past, I think it's seven or eight years now, I've been uh, a co-host on the Nintendo Fuse podcast, uh, which is every other Tuesday now at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. And we do those live. Uh, if you watched our last episode, you would have seen Oni there as a special guest, which was awesome to have. And uh, as of later last year, I think November I started, I became a co-host on the Switch Mania playcast. That is with Jeffrey and with JP of JP Switch Mania. We do that every week where we play a game of the week, which is not always a good game. And sometimes <laughs> we regret them, but we do it for, for people. And uh, yeah, I'm, I just love video games i love the industry i love talking about it and i'm honored to be here so thank you what what would you say is the most challenging game you've had to play for a podcast oh for a podcast or for review <laughs> uh let, let's go each because i feel like they can uh they deserve their own separate categories um for for review i definitely will say the the worst game i probably have ever reviewed um was actually on the switch was a game called rockets 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 <laughs> which is is absolutely terrible. It's a, it's like a like a dog fighting Smash Brothers style game where you're rockets but you're moving at super speed. So picture playing Sonic in Smash Brothers where you can't stop and you're moving 10 times faster and everyone is Sonic. It is terrible. Um, that actually just sounds like every time I play Sonic and Smash Bros. So <laughs> it, it is it is terrible. Um so that would probably be my worst. Um for the for like the, the playcast I, it's it's probably a game that we're going to be talking about shortly, and I don't want to say that oh um, because that one that one's actually provided by the developer for us to talk about, which is really bad. <laughs> um, um, but outside of that one, without spoiling, um, I would probably say Gigantic Army, uh, which is also mm -hmm. on the Switch. Um, it's just I don't know if you've played it. It is a really short game. It's super slow. It's unforgiving. And it's boring. It's boring. <laughs> okay. it's, it's a, it is a 30-minute game. Like, no joke, beginning to end, it is a 30-minute game. But it feels like you've played it for three hours. Mm. At least for me and for for everyone else we, we talked with. Yeah, it was just uh, not a wow. good Wow. <laughs> Gigantic Army. I might have to look that up just, just to say that I did it. No, no, you have to <laughs> say that you're going to go back and listen to that episode of his podcast. Yeah, we did, we did a playcast all about it. Come on, no, 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 I'll play that in the background while I'm playing the game. Oh, that, that, that's acceptable. That's acceptable. Yeah, there you go, there you go. In fact, we'll make it a whole, like, Inception-esque uh, reaction video no, where I'm playing the game, <laughs> reacting to the game while listening to you in the background and talking to the recording. There you go. That, see, that would be interesting. Galen, I'm literally going to murder you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the podcast where there's murder within the first few minutes. <laughs> Mario doesn't murder, but I do. <laughs> Just before we get into what we've been playing this week, and of course my very deep thoughts on uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake Demo, <laughs> want to remind folks that we are a weekly show. Episodes go live every Sunday. If you're just joining us, thanks to the lovely Barry, welcome, and I hope that you stick around. We are on all of the podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbooty, whatever you call it, whatever you listen to, we're probably there. Please take a moment to rate us on your listening platform of choice. It is the best way to support our show. Galen, it's what? 
the best way to support our show, but I'm st- you had me at Pod Booty. Yeah, so. I'm trying to think of what kind of podcasts are actually on a, a site called Pod Booty. It's me and, and literally nobody there. else. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to our adventure log. So just before we jump into our games, Galen, where can people find you playing video games on the internet? If people want to find me talking about all the games I love, uh, they can message me on Twitter at Mobius087. And if they want to look at my bearded face, I guess, (laughs) I've got an Instagram too. (laughs) Well, you can avoid me on Instagram then. Uh, Make sure you do not reverse psychology. Uh, Go to true underscore Mobius to check me out there. I'll stay very far away from that. I will be Mm -hmm, staying mm -hmm. on Twitter at Oni underscore Dino, where I'm pulling my hair out and posting videos of me playing Final Fantasy VII Remake Demo. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. And then, Barry, how about you? Uh, I'm I'm also on the Twitter, uh, at Hawk Hellfire. And, uh, yeah, if you want to see me on Facebook, you can find me at Nintendo Fuse. And on YouTube, you can actually see sometimes my bearded face, sometimes my shaved face, depending <laughs> on how lazy I was, at Nintendo Fuse's YouTube page, which you can go to youtube.com slash Nintendo Fuse. I'm telling you, Barry, just em- embrace the beard. Just, you know, get get some beard oil to go with <laughs> it. And yeah, you'll be good. You know what? I don't mind the beard that much. It's my wife that does. She does not <laughs> like the beard. So after a while, I kind of get that look like you need to shave. And I'm like, oh, fine. I'll go do it. <laughs> my wife is the exact opposite. So <laughs> well, Galen, uh, you do lucky. look like a freakish goblin without any beard hair. Seriously, like I get carded when I go to movies when I shave my beard. Yeah, off, but they're not so. carding you because they think you're under 21. They're carding you because they're not sure if you're from this planet. Yeah, yeah, that's a separate card, you know, my lizard person card. Did you just blink? One of did you just blink sideways with your <laughs> lizard eyes? I did, I did. You ever seen that chase scene at the beginning of Men in Black? It's kind of like that. I haven't, oh, but yeah. you know what I have seen? Snack what? World. Why don't you tell me about it? <laughs> Snack World. Wait, why do I have to tell you about it if you've seen it? I don't think you understood your segue there, Galen. <laughs> Galen, so I, I know have... how. You do a yes and in freaking what is that called? Improv. Instead, you were like, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to side with Galen on this one, though. That, that was a pretty bad segue. <laughs> yes! This is I have a, friend. a huge <laughs> mistake. <laughs> so I have been playing some more Snack World. The excitement of this game has not let up. I found that this is a great game to not only sit down for an extended period of time and be like, hey, I have an afternoon to kill. Let's dive into this and grind out some keychains and go monster hunting a little bit. And on the opposite ah, on the opposite side of that, this is also a great game to be like, hey, I've had a really long day. I have to go to bed in like half an hour, but let me just pull out my Switch and just, you know relax for a little bit like it it falls on both ends of the spectrum and i find that not all games actually does that so i'm very appreciative there is it a dangerous trap though is it like a spider's web where you're like i'll play a half hour two hours later oh well that's how it is for any video game that i'm into (laughs) so uh heck that's me when i go onto youtube believe it or not oh youtube holes are not good holes youtube holes are the worst holes they're dirty (laughs) Well, I don't know what channels you're watching, but my YouTube holes are never that dirty. (laughs) Like, you will sometimes, like, roll into, like, you know, bloopers or, like, jokes or something like that. And then you'll eventually, not eventually, very quickly, like, quicker than you think, you'll be like, I just saw someone die. (laughs) I haven't gone that far down the hole. I haven't uh... gone that far down either. Okay. (laughs) Trying to listen to Snack World. (laughs) So, as is the trend that I've been creating, I do have a couple of Monsters of the Week that I want to recommend. The first one is the Little Witch uh, Sabrinetta, which it's just a little witch that flies around on a broom and follows you around. Hmm. There is the Orc Orc Word, who I've only come across once while fighting him, but he just says very, like, 
he said he's very awkward and that's his whole shtick. Like I'm trying to think of one of the examples of the things that he says, but it's just coming to a blank. I thought you were going to say he was like racist or something like that. No, 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 no. But he does actually have like a Southern, you know, redneck esque accent. So are you saying all Southern people are racists? You know, I'm married to a Southerner. I don't know. Galen, do you want to (laughs) wade into this pool? Um, I'm just saying that they definitely decided to uh, go a certain direction. The uh, last monster I want to recommend is the Claim Jumper, who this one was kind of clever because he is a magic using uh, imp slash frog s creature with a gigantic uh, crystal on its head. And he often finds himself buried in the ground and then he pops up and jumps around and does magic attacks on you. Interesting. Claim jumper is like an old term from like the 20s or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's all about uh, looking for those, you know, precious ores and gold and everything like that. But the reason that I keep doing these like monsters of the week, because with the, the way that the story is actually broken out is very reminiscent of that. So I've gone like two or three chapters into the game so far, and I'm starting to recognize a formula in the story where it's not this overarching progressional type thing. It's, hey, the princess wants something ridiculous. Go and find it. And the entire chapter and everything that you encounter with that is all revolving around that plot point. What what are some examples of like the weird things that she wants? So in the second chapter, this one was one of my favorites. Um, there is this new makeup that is supposed to be a rejuvenating, skin refreshing uh, item that is very rare and very hard to find, and she absolutely must have some. It's called BB cream. It comes from South Korea. <laughs> so she has, or you and Chup, who is this. Uh, NPC who follows you around, helps you in battle, but he's absolutely enamored. He is enthralled by the princess and just wants... It's ridiculous how he acts. Um, But he follows you around and you have to go and do this quest. And you get to the end and you have to find a kraken and because it's an oil from the kraken. And then you beat the kraken and then you realize that it's it's poop. It's just kraken poop. That's all this is. Oh my god. So she's just smearing feces on her face? Uh-huh. Absolutely. And they they give you little bits of dialogue in there where you get to select what you what your character says. And in this one, it was particular all three options to choose from were the words it's poop, but they censored it in different ways, like the first two letters, and then the two middle letters, and then the last two letters. Oh, cool. Which I, I thought that was really cute. So you get this cream, you bring it back, and you're like, okay, here you go, here's your thing, but I don't really recommend using it at all. And she's like, oh, what, don't you want to see me slather this all over my body? And Shop is just like, oh my god, slather it all over you, yes, please, wait, no, that's the thing, wait, yes, but I want to see this, wait, no! And there's this, like, moral dilemma. (laughs) There's this, like, moral dilemma within him while, and it's just so innocently grotesque. <laughs> mm-hmm. Remember, Nintendo is a family-friendly company. Oh, right, right. It's family <laughs> company. <laughs> but, like, that entire thing is, like, that's the entire purpose of that entire chapter. And, like, the next chapter that I'm on right now, um, my character has to go and get tickets for the princess to be able to meet up with uh, this girl band that just came into town. So <laughs> Perfume, right, yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, it's it's very kind of monster of the week esque where it's almost little chapters uh-huh. or little episodes, and it's very digestible. Mm, that's lovely. I really mm-hmm. really need to play this game. I feel like this is the kind of game that if I was to stop playing and then come back like oh I don't know a month down the line, I could pick it up, start playing again, and remember exactly how to play and where I was at. As opposed to other games like, oh my god, I have not played this. Why are all these monsters dancing around uh, (laughs) uh, J-pop idols? What's going on? That's that's really reassuring. And also, I love J-pop idols and monsters dancing. That's why I play Tokyo Mirage (laughs) Sessions. And that's the segue that I was going for. (laughs) I'm not going to talk about Tokyo Mirage Sessions. What are you talking about? 
No, 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 no. But I'm just saying, like, that's that's why I brought it up because I know you like that game. Oh well, I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, Galen, that sounds excellent. Barry, how about you tell us about whatever you've been playing this week? Well, ironically, well, not not this week, but I just recently did finish Tokyo Mirage Sessions. Shark yeah, Deathly. congratulations! And, uh, and it it is a lot better than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, the the battle system is truly phen- phenomenal. It is absolutely one of the most fun battle systems I've actually uh, experienced in an RPG. It never gets old, right? Yeah, I I honestly think it's better than Bravely Defaults, which was one of my favorites prior to. Yeah, yeah. But I wish the RNG wasn't as high. Like, you know, it wasn't as reliant on, on RNG with the whole um, duet. But when you get a couple duets in there, it's just funny watching the overkill meter. Oh, yeah. Um, but no, it, that is a good time. Um, after that, I did uh, some Darksiders Genesis, which uh, oh, just came nice. out. Then that is, uh, that is for those that don't know, it's a Diablo-esque game uh, in the Darksiders universe, but it does not take place after the first game like we've all been waiting. It takes place years and years and years before it, mm. unfortunately. Mm. Uh, there's no loot, but there is like an exploration aspect, and they want you to backtrack, and you have to if you want 100% this game. But I didn't do that. I, I just went through it because some of the some of the chapters are a little long, but it is, it is a meaty game, and it is a fun game with one particular quirk where it actually doesn't show you where you are on the map. Um, Weird. Uh, and unlo- like, if you ever played Diablo, you can bring up like the map that like overlays, which is awesome. This you can't do it; you have to pause to see the map. Um, but it like highlights the area of the map you're in, but not where you currently are. And on like a big f- open area, like it just oh you're somewhere here, and you gotta try to use landmarks. Um, but otherwise, I thought it was enjoyable for what mm. it was. I mean, it's not I don't I wouldn't say game of the year material, mm. but but it's absolutely a good time. And now I am playing something that is Game of the Year material, which is Rune Factory 4 Special. Oh. Um, <laughs> such a good game. I, I was floored because I hadn't played a Harvest Moon since uh, Wonderful Life on GameCube. And man, is this game good. It's got the, the creature taming like, like Snack World, but it's got the, the Secret of Mana style with the, with the weapons and leveling up the different weapons with skills. And the, the crafting is, is awesome. And the, the farming is really easy and, and addicting. Hmm. And it's just one of those things where it, it never stops. Like you may, Maybe you can make like a new armor and you're like, oh, I got to go out and fight these enemies and, and farm the materials to make that armor. And you make that armor and it level up your forging and you're like, yeah. And then, you, you know, you, you eat bread to gain new recipes and you gain a new recipe for a new armor that's even stronger. And it's like, oh, now I got to go do this. And it, like, <laughs> it never ends, but it's so much fun. The story is good. Um, it, it leaves a lot of questions. It plays on the whole amnesia trope, which oh. is played to death. Yeah, but yeah. Outside of that, there's different romance options, and there's some luck. It's so weird. I've never played a game with romance where there's actually luck involved. Like, if you huh. say, hey, I want this girl or this guy to be my boyfriend or girlfriend, um, it's like, cool, well, you got to... Every every character in the town has, a, like, a reputation meter, and the more you give gifts, the more you talk to them, they, they like you more. And you can actually take any villager you want into battle. Like, you could take the old granny, like, let's go fight. Um, she's probably gonna die, but you can bring her. Doesn't matter. There's no permadeath. Sounds like Watch Dogs Three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Watch Dogs Three. <laughs> but but say so so in order for them to like be your your lover, they have to be like I think seven. So when you get them to seven, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna tell them I love them, and they're like, oh, I, I, you're gotta be joking. And like, wait, what? But the guide says it has to be seven, <laughs> and it turns out there's a there's a luck. So you save and you, you ask them and you have to constantly reload your save and eventually, oh, yeah, really? Okay, let's do it. Like, what? <laughs> Why Just like that in real life. life. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that in real life. How many times? No? Okay, reset. Let's try this again until you say yes. <laughs> what are you saying? I gave you 35 frying pans in a row. Are you saying you're not affected by that? <laughs> <laughs> So, so that part is kind of weird, um, but it, it is also kind of funny because, like Harvest Moon games, you can get married in the game, and if you play a, a female character, it's nice because you just go on dates with the guys and eventually they propose to you, and if you really want, you can propose to them, but it's like no big deal. But if you're the guy, you've got to actually craft the engagement ring, you've got to make sure you have a double bed, you know, you got to do like all these <laughs> things to make sure it's ready for them. Like, wait a minute, this, this is not fair, <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> Yeah, be more um, progressive, Root Factory. Come on. 
<laughs> so yeah, th these are interesting things that I wonder if they will carry on to the fifth game. But no, honestly, it I'm having a lot of fun. Um, and I, I actually suggested this for the next Switch Mania Playcast uh, game because I think it is one of those games that people shouldn't sleep on. And I don't think they are because it's sold out on Amazon and oh, cool. you know it's getting hard to find at Best Buy, which is great because you know, the developers of this game went bankrupt and Marvelous took them in and rejuvenated the series and awesome. has taken a chance with this, you know, this game and it is definitely worth playing. And like, you know, I haven't played Snack World, but everything you described as Snack World sounds very much similar to Rune Factory. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Does Rune Factory have uh, poop krakens? It does not have poop krakens. No, that is something it does not have. Galen, what but does it... have poop krakens besides Snack Snack World? <laughs> uh, Conger's Bad Fur Day. That has the great mighty poo. Uh, you know, you know what? I'll concede there. See, you yeah. can't just spout nonsense. You're sitting here with two people who know games. Blue Dragon does have poop enemies, though. Listen, <laughs> I just, I really want to come onto this show and just spout out off all this shit, but it just, mmm. I can't do it sometimes. But I'm. <laughs> your your jokes, Galen. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's episode That's seventy. You have joke. to level up. <laughs> I'm sorry you have to stick with my crap all the time. I don't know. Shut. I'm muting you. I'm, I'm literally <laughs> muting your it's, entire look, audio it's, track it's, this episode. It's not, it's not your fault you have a shitty personality when it comes to this, okay? Oh, no. Not you, too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, come on. Join us. Join us. <laughs> come on in. The water's great. Just a little brown. It's okay. <laughs> So anyway, Rune Factory Special, sounding like a home run. It is. And honestly, it really is. Um, just, uh, although I, I screwed up a little bit, I definitely recommend saving often, which I did. And uh, I forgot to right before we did this, this, this podcast. And I accidentally was trying to put a piece of uh, vegetables into my cell box and I accidentally gave it to one of my monsters and I'm like no I wanted to sell that so I had to restart <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you can actually get monsters like snack world and they can work on your farm which is great you can make them like water and plant seeds so you don't have to worry about that and you can just do the adventuring oh that's really cool that's good because it can be a little bit like intimidating if somebody is like oh I really want to try all this stuff out but like I don't know the the farming aspect doesn't really interest me but it's cool that you can be like, oh, no, here, you know, set up your, your, uh, oh, God, what were those called in Final Fantasy XII? Gambits. Set up your gambits, gambits and then just let it play itself. Truthfully, you don't even need to do the farming. If you, you, could just, you could play the game without it. Just know that enemies only drop materials. They don't drop money. And you would just have to sell the materials hmm. um, for money. But you get money. It, like like most farming games, I, there's a pickup. So at 8 o'clock in the morning, everything gets picked up from the box. But you can also open up a little shop in your house where people come and you could barter with them like, oh no, you really want this for more money and kind of deal. So you can do, there's like a bartering system as well. There's a <laughs> lot to this game. It's ridiculous. Do either of you ever take like an objective a step back and kind of look at the situation that we as gamers kind of put ourselves into? Like Every day I speak have... with you. Yes, Galen, I do. <laughs> we have the power to control time. If you're playing Fire Emblem and one of your people's perma dies, you have the ability to reset the game or restart the level and fix the mistakes that you have. Yep. And then on the other hand, oh, I gave some veggies to a monster. I shouldn't have done that. Okay, rewrite right reality. Well, yeah, it was a high-level veggie, and I needed it to get more seeds. And <laughs> <laughs> I needed those. I wasn't sure if I was going to grow them again. Yeah, a doy, Galen, <laughs> high level veggie. Right, I, I will. Right. I will say this too. There, there's a at least during the summer there's a typhoon, which I didn't realize happens like a thunderstorm is a really bad storm. And I was like, oh, there's this you know item you could get to protect from typhoon. I'm like, oh, my farm's going to be fine. And I'm literally watching my crops that are ready to harvest like disappear and turn into rocks as like the oh, soil no. grows. And I'm like, oh my god! And, like I'm I I walked away and I came back like the next day and like my whole farm was destroyed. I'm like, wow, it's real life for you. Oh, <laughs> Gotta I, do it I, again. I, I just imagine you're like the dog sitting at the co or drinking a coffee at the table yes. where the entire kitchen is on fire. It's like, hmm, this is fine. Ev everything is fine. <laughs> I'm going adventuring. <laughs> Screw it. I'm going to go kill some enemies. <laughs> go level up. Grandma, get your shield. Come on. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Grandma into the fold. You can bring your monsters into the fold, too, if you really mm -hmm. like. So yeah. 
you know, if there's like a giant ogre or something, you can grab and put on your mm-hmm. team. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to backtrack a little bit, but one thing I forgot to mention about Snack World is that's something you can actually do too. Like the monsters that you're coming across and everything is. Those are monsters you can actually not only bring onto your team and carry on with you, but you can also actually turn into your monsters as well. So it just adds a little bit more to that uh, diversity in the gameplay as well. It's time to talk about this, guys. The Final Fantasy VII Remake Demo. (laughs) Here we go. Um, I very much love Final Fantasy VII. The original is one of my favorite games. It definitely has some flaws, but I do love that game and its cast. I played it a bajillion times throughout my life back when it originally came out in, what was it, 97 or something like that, that that came out? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beginning in 97. And uh, I played it as recently as uh, last year, as I am now a 58-year-old man. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Checks out. Continue. Right. You're only as old as you feel. There, there was no joke there. A 508-year-old man. There's, <laughs> there's still no joke there. Galen, you're more spicy this episode. I don't like it. <laughs> Before I get into this game, I want to mention a little bit about uh, what I've been seeing online. There has been some like very petulant gatekeeping online in terms of this game. If people are criticizing it or if they're voicing their, their thoughts, their critiques online, there's uh, some people jumping on top of them and saying that uh, you can't say that. <laughs> so what you're saying is this episode's not going to air because Square's going to take it down. Oh no. No, 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 mm. no. Square allows it. Square is fine with that. It's the fans that are the worst. <laughs> we are a news podcast and we are bringing the news that there are people online who have opinions about Final Fantasy VII. And I'm one of them. So anyway, <laughs> considering that I've read some of these terrible takes, I have brought and highlighted one take that I wanted to read out because it is just really bad. So somebody posted something, I think it was on Twitter, I can't remember. Somebody posted some critiques and, you know, they were good. They weren't just like, oh, this game sucks. They were like, oh, I don't like that it doesn't have this or it does have this or whatever. And this person wrote this comment and I'm going to quote it here. It's not a new age casual gamers game. It's based on classic systems. If you don't like it, don't play it. Simple. And leave this to the real classic RPG gamers. End quote. I could hear the fedora on him. Yeah, he's got a Fedrova on. This is a classic case of a person tying a video game to a part of their personality, and then they are personally offended that somebody, a stranger online, does not like the game. And I wanted to bring this up because I think that this is creepy and weird behavior and it happens so frequently we see it so much online that I think we kind of gloss over it a little bit, but I just don't want to understate just how wrong and unhealthy this mindset is to have. Mm. I mean, I get what he's trying to say Mm. and, and, you know, not every game is for everybody. Mm. Um, You know, like a lot of people love Animal Crossing and a lot of people have no idea why. that's the beauty of video games is there's so many different genres and you should play what you enjoy and, and try new genres and if you don't like it no big deal mm. but uh but the way he said it <laughs> is just oh it's like entitlement yeah total mm-hmm. gatekeeping being like well you don't under- you don't like it because you don't understand it it's a flawless game you know it's either either an extreme that's it's that's it it can't just be like oh this was fun but i have criticisms you know yeah Uh, So anyway, let's get into the demo here. So what happens with the demo is that you are playing as Cloud. He is a mercenary joining up with a team of eco-terrorists. They are going to a reactor called a Mako reactor. And the Mako reactor absorbs the life force of the planet uh, for like energy production. And your mission is to detonate a bomb at the reactor's core to stop it from functioning. Oh, and I forgot to mm. mention, the, the name of the eco-terrorist is called Avalanche. That will come up I- I- later on in this test. <laughs> so there's your premise, right? Like, if you're not familiar with Final Fantasy VII, that's, that's what's going on. The combat system in this remake, in this demo, is an action RPG style. So you attack, you block, you dodge, whenever you like. And for the sake of brevity, I will say that it's, like, somewhat, somewhat similar to Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, I can kind of agree with that. 
I'll explain a little bit more later, but you know, just to try and avoid as much technical details as possible. That's there's a little idea for you. You also have MP and you have an ATB gauge. It's kind of weird that ATB is in there because ATB back then stood for active time battle. What this ATB gauge is, is like just a meter that you accrue throughout battle. And then once you get a point on that meter, you can then use a spell, an item, or a special attack whenever you like. Mm -hmm. Spells are tied to MP, so they also cost ATB meter and MP. Mm -hmm. Now, to accrue this, you either attack an enemy, you defend against an attack, get hit, move around, all this stuff increases your ATB meter, just being active, basically. So that's kind of the basics of battle. The the basics of battle, there's also the character-specific abilities that they have on it that's also linked. So Cloud, for example, has his stance changes that he can do. Oh, that's right. There's those things, too. Mm-hmm. Which I think is worth mentioning because it really does give a bit of complexity as to why you would want to play as cloud versus like barrett for example right right they did a really okay let me that's a good segue for me because um i have a list of likes and dislikes so let's go into the likes first i want to highlight the positive because i do like a lot about this game one of those okay. things is that like you mentioned galen where each character has their own individual special stance or special attack that they do so cloud is that he turns into like a close range killing machine and mm -hmm. you know high risk high reward kind of situation barrett's yeah. is that he has like a special shot that he does that does a lot of damage and you have to wait for that to charge back up but you can spend your time charging it back up uh even faster by instead of doing an attack you just press your charge button so it's cool to have these different skills and really highlight that these characters play very differently. I'm excited to see what the other characters are going to be because both Cloud and Barrett play very, very differently in this demo. And I, I'm not I'm not sure that they actually give you enough time once they introduce Barrett into the party to really get a sense of how different these two characters play. At least that wasn't my impression when I played the demo. Oh, okay. I felt it right away. Yeah. For me personally, I found myself keep wanting to switch back to Cloud because, and that could also be partly my my preferred play style. Like, uh -huh. I very much am the kind of person who I would love to just run up and do a bunch of damage as opposed to stand on the sidelines and just do that support fire. Uh -huh. um, I used him more as a, just that, a support role, especially because he does have the healing magic. And it was, it was interesting. I would only focus on healing when I had to by switching back to Cloud and using the potions. So Cloud would use the potions. Barrett would use the magic primarily as the healer. Gotcha. Uh, Barry, by the way, have you tried out this demo or heard anything about this demo? I have not played it, nor do I have any interest. In oh, okay. You're not, a, <laughs> you're, you're not a Final Fantasy VII guy, or what's the deal there? I love Final Fantasy. been playing since the first game. And while 7 was good, I feel it was blown up way yes. higher than it ever should have been, even back in 97. Yes. And I had so many people back in like high school be like, oh my god, this game is incredible. Like, someone dies, you you lose somebody. Like, that's never happened before. And I'm like, really? Did you not play Final Fantasy 4? Did you not play Final Fantasy 6? Yeah, yeah. Like, people <laughs> die. I had to tell Yang's wife that her husband's not coming back, okay? Yeah. Seeing Aerys getting stabbed is nothing. Like, it had no emotional effect on me. Um, yeah. It was just one of those things where... Uh, it was it was a good game that the, the the really the rabid fanboys and I have to say that only because of how much they pressured Square um, into making the compilation of Final Fantasy VII with all the extra games and even this remake mm. is only in existence because people kept hounding their email mm. remake it remake it remake it um, especially after that PS3 tech demo came out and oh my god <laughs> um, so I. I you know, I might get it, I might not. Uh, I'm kind of mad that they're not even giving you the... F like, they know these fanboys are so hungry that they're willing to pay $60 or more for half a game. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. they're uh, literally I will selling get into that for part. sure, because that is a Absolutely. huge gripe with me. And and that is just, like... Ugh. Like, if, if, if they're going to remake, you know, a game, I'd love for them to, to do five or six, since they mm -hmm. kind of already did three and four, mm -hmm. and one and two in a way. But... 
it's it's just one of those things where I feel RPGs have evolved since then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and and you like I play Final Fantasy 14 right now, which I think is a much better game. Mm. Um, but even in Final Fantasy 11 and 14, you can't go anywhere without seeing somebody named Cloud Sephiroth with the last name Strife, and then variations <laughs> of it like XX Cloud XX or XX mm-hmm. X Sephiroth XX, <laughs> like. Like, oh my God, be original people. Like, well, you know, it sounds like that's their their hotmail address back in two thousand four. It, 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 <laughs> it probably it still is. It probably is. Ninety nine. Ninety eight. Ninety eight. Ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, it could still be, but and you can't go anywhere without it, and it's just like mm-hmm. so much, like yeah. on there, and it's it's so funny too because you can tell Square kind of likes to troll the fanboys too. Um, I don't know if you play 14 or if you have played 14 at no, all. No, I have a garbage PC. Um, well, they, <laughs> the, la- the last expansion, Stormblood, they did this for the raid tier. They did this really cool thing where the f- it's divided into f- uh, three groups of four raids. Um, the first group came out, and it was three Final Fantasy V enemies and then X-Death with oh, Neo nice. X-Death. And it was like, oh my god, this is fantastic. And the second set came out, and it was three Final Fantasy VI enemies, including Doom Train, <laughs> and then uh, Kefka with God Kefka. Oh, I did see And it was see like, that, oh yeah. my god, this is fantastic. So everyone's like, oh, the third tier, it's going to be seven, you know, five, six, seven. And the third <laughs> tier came out, and it was not seven. It was Chaos from Final Fantasy One, <laughs> and then Omega. <laughs> and it was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping you were going to say, and it was Billeth from Fire Emblem Three Houses. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that would that would be funny, actually. That would that would get a whole other fan base going crazy. <laughs> That's a whole new can of worms. Yeah, it is. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to say though that I think that this uh, Final Fantasy VII remake project is also um, kind of on Square Enix's wall kind of like a in case of emergency break glass situation i think that that's Mm -hmm, partly why the this uh remake came to fruition well they have a lot of those and and i think it's interesting that they chose that i mean how many people have wanted wanted a a fourth chrono trigger if you count Mm. let's do that 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 easily hit that glass break that wall a new mana game and we were getting trials of mana which is awesome yes but and i can't (laughs) wait for that but like a new new mana game uh you know like like there's so many franchises that Square has and a lot mm-hmm. of people have forgotten about because it's either all Final Fantasy or, you know, with Enix now, you know, Dragon Quest. Right. It's either um, Final which are Fantasy or Kingdom Hearts. That's all you're really hearing. Yeah. Kingdom Hearts. Uh, again, and, and even Kingdom Hearts 3 was an emergency break glass situation, really. And and they did that because how many years did people want that to come out? That, that yeah. whole series is an emergency, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Final Fantasy series, in my opinion... I, again, I didn't play the, the, the remake, and it might be fantastic when it comes out, but it what it needs is it needs 16 to come out and needs 16 to be good and to wipe away what Final Fantasy 15 was. It yeah. needs Final Fantasy not 15 to was a be mess. Nomura's hands, I think. That or it needs to be with Nomura involved and under strict regulations, unlike 15. It needs to not be a Final Fantasy. No, it, it, it needs Final to Fantasy be a Final Fantasy. What are you talking about? It can't it can't be sixteen without Final Fantasy. But, <laughs> but look look at how many missteps they've had Galen, with the just series. Let so the far. adults talk, would you? I mean, Final Fantasy fifteen was a mess when it was versus thirteen. It was mm-hmm. a mess for years upon years. Then when it came out, it was still a mess. The demos were a mess. You know, a lot of people, myself included, didn't like it. Then they had the episodes, the extra DLC that they had to cut short because they just pulled the plug before they even finished on it. Yeah. Then you have the City of Final Fantasy NT, which was a great game, but they shoehorned in three v three when people wanted one v one. Yeah. That yeah. game just got the can, and there's no future plans for Dissidia anymore, which sucks because I love that series and so many others do. So, the Final Fantasy needs. An honest to God light bulb. Like 14 is the only positive thing that's come out in the past few years right. that has the Final Fantasy name. Yeah, the, mm-hmm. the Final Fantasy name doesn't hold as much weight anymore as it did, you know, years ago. Yeah. And honestly, I think it's because it's oversaturated and the ones that most people relate most strongly to are the ones like 7 and 8. Or if you're, you know, old, old school gamers like 5 and or 6. They're the same thing. 
<laughs> They're not the same thing. What is wrong with you? Galen, do you want me to cut that because that was so embarrassing? Gal Galif did not sacrifice his life for you to say the same thing. <laughs> Shadow did not wait around on that floating island to die for that same yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to get Sabin to bum rush you. How about that? <laughs> my, my point is that I feel that Square has kind of dug themselves into this hole of if they are going to come out with a game it's got to be related to one of their major IPs. And if they do come out with a game in one of their major IPs, it now has this monumental task of not only superseding all the games that came out before it, but also superseding the expectations and the mm. nostalgia of all of that. I think there's also a stylistic choice that they choose with a lot of their games, even if they're not specifically Final Fantasy games, if they're like an offshoot, um, where they end up feeling or looking very Final Fantasy. And yeah. I think that that is now a detriment, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, that, that doesn't apply totally. I mean, look at Tokyo RPG Factory. I mean, they're kind of going for the more Chrono Trigger-esque with uh, I Am Satsuna, and then Lost Sphere was different, it's and Oninaki was, was very different. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was a big uh, proponent of Oninaki. Yeah, I love Oninaki. Yeah. Then they also did what that left behind was that was them too, right? Or left alive? Yeah, mm -hmm. left alive. That was them. Like. Oh yeah, God, I wanted to play that game, but the uh, everything I heard about it was like it is it is sucks. But yeah, it looks so gorgeous. Like the uh, art, it is so front mission for the Super Nintendo. It is so uh, evocative of like uh, Amano Yoshitaka, his art. Yeah, you know, I, I haven't played it, but I have it. But it, it does look good. Mm. <laughs> and that's another thing, Front Mission. Front Mission. What what is that series? Uh -huh. You know, let's bring that back. Yeah. It's so many Romancing Saga three just got re released on the Switch. Yeah, did you play uh Romancing Saga on the, what was it called on the Switch? Scarlet Scarlet Ambitions? That I did not play. You should give it a shot because it's not a full price game and it is a ton of fun uh with the battle system. It's it's crazy how good that battle system is. That was digital only, wasn't it? I believe in the West it's digital only, yeah. There might be a yeah. like Asia physical edition or something like that yeah i think there was but i don't think it's in english but they they have other titles too i mean star ocean how about a star ocean six that mm -hmm. i mean they just re-released the first yeah one. i, I think star, star ocean, ocean was so five good. was really not well received no so i think that they're probably gonna th that's the thing too is that like they only want to make the safest of decisions so that's why like with galen with what you said um, you know, it has to be tied to one of their big things. It's because I feel like they maybe choose too big of a project or something like that. Something mm -hmm. like they did with Scarlet Grace. I mean, that's a like an updated port of a Vita game, but that that's a smaller project, right? Like, do some well, smaller games. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a AAA game. Well, and also, like, as you were saying before, they're, they're going with the safe bet, which from a business standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. Like, you want to go with what you can confirm is going to get you the most amount of money. Can, I mean, do you think that we would have gotten a Final Fantasy 13 Part 1, 2, and 3 if it was just the results of Final Fantasy 13? If it did not have that Final Fantasy moniker on it? Well, Final Fantasy 2, or sorry, Final Fantasy 13 2 underperformed, so it's surprising that they even went with a 13 3, and when they did, mm -hmm. that one sold like absolute hot garbage. Which is sad, too, because I think 13.2 was my favorite of the trilogy. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed it. It would have been my favorite. Well, I mean, out of the three of them, I think that that's probably an easy choice. But I hated the two main characters, man. Uh, Sarah I, and, I didn't mind and them. Kingdom Hearts Boy. No. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever his I love, name was. But, but what, I, what I love about that game, though, is I love the time travel. I love the different endings. But I love the fact that the actual, like, they left on a really good cliffhanger. Like, better cliffhanger than most games. Uh, in 13.2? 13 too. I didn't beat it because I hated the characters. I liked everything right. else about oh, it. Oh, you would have you would have loved it then because if, when you and this is spoilers I guess if you haven't played it, but when Who you cares? get to the proper ending, you like you beat the villain and you're like, "Oh yeah, this is good." And everyone's cheering and suddenly you realize that all your struggles against time were futile and like the sky starts opening up and like Sarah collapses and dies and like everyone starts dying around like all the all your main characters start dying and you're like, "Oh my god, what's happening?" and it's like to be continued. <laughs> it's like holy crap <laughs> uh, I don't That's know dark. if I like that 
<laughs> like like you could YouTube it, but it's just it's one of those things where it's like, oh my god, I, it makes you want to get a third game because you have mm. to find that. You can't leave yeah. a story where all your main characters are dead or private. I think I think Noel survives. I think he's holding Sarah's body. Uh, but you know, part of my criticisms too of some of the recent releases of Square when you know they're big big games like that is the writing. I feel like, and this is similar to, and I'm throwing it back at you, Galen, with like, uh, what's the Star Trek uh, Picard that you recommended recently? Yes. It's very much like Alex Kurtzman styled writing, where it's like, we're just going to do something because it sounds cool, or it sounds mysterious, and we'll figure it out later, or whatever. They write the absolute opposite way in so many so many instances with Final Fantasy, Square, Square Enix does. And like, it gets convoluted for the sake of convoluted, Kingdom Hearts oh. is that. Oh. Is that. You know what I mean? And it's just Kingdom Hearts it's convolution. Like, like everything about that game should sell me on it. Everything should. But the fact that the story is so nonsense and it's so story focused on something that doesn't make sense at all and they keep making things up, it's just like I don't care anymore. I will not play your game. I'm in the same boat. There is no way that Square can be blind to this kind of criticism. So do you think there's like a couple of writers over at Square who are working on Kingdom Hearts who are just like basking in it all and just being like, you know what, let's embrace this chaos that we've created and let's make the most convoluted piece of material that we possibly can. And they are completely doing this on purpose. I will tell you, though, that all of the games that I have these, you know, heavy criticisms of are games that are either produced or directed by Nomura in his in his later years. Mm. So that's why whenever I see him attached to a very important role in a project, I'm always very nervous of it. Like, look at Trials of Mana right now, okay? I am in love with that game. I, I There was a new gameplay trailer that just came out for it, and it looks even better than it did before. That game looks awesome, and it has nowhere... Uh, nowhere damn it. Nomura's name is nowhere to be found on that game. Hmm... You, you very well might be right. I mean, you, you even said your your distaste for 13, and that was convoluted. That had a whole dictionary for all yeah. these terms that they just threw at you. They didn't even stop to explain what they were. I know. They just assumed you knew so what they were. It was so badly integrated. It was terribly <laughs> integrated. And don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed playing 13. I don't think it's a good game, but I enjoyed playing it. So th you didn't play 13, oh, Lightning Returns then either? No, 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 no. Hmm. See, I will say this. 13 as a whole is not anywhere near my top favorites. Mm -hmm. However, the the ending of Lightning Returns redeems, in my opinion, the entire thing. And it honestly made playing the whole thing worthwhile. Really? Huh. Like, I really, really enjoyed that ending. And I know some people probably like, I think suck, bah. And you know what? That's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. But the way they ended that, like, at the very end, you know, like, Lightning is saying goodbye to Odin, you know, her, her summon from the whole thing. And, like, I literally had tears. I was like, oh, my God, like, this is actually, like, I understand the journey they went on. Mm. Um, and, like, the way it ended was really interesting because they kind of tied it into, like, a precursor to, to ironically, Seven because everything had to tie back to Seven. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. What? <laughs> like, like, it, it kind of goes back to where they go into a more technological world. Like they they reboot the universe and now it's more like it's seven and it's 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 definitely leaning more towards that way because lightning was built as a female cloud to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Even physically, she looks like cloud. Yeah. Everything ties to seven because that was such a monumental sales, you know, and, and breakthrough for them, and that's only because they got really smart people to advertise that game. Like mm -hmm. the commercials were awesome. Yeah, the advertising was amazing on that. Like, the commercials, like you said, is so good. And then, um, I, like, people that didn't even play JRPGs or know what a Japanese RPG was back then were talking about that game. And I was like, yep. whoa, this is amazing. Because, of course, you know, Barry, probably you and I had similar um, interest in games back then. Like, I was playing JRPGs constantly. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it was cool that finally people were talking about it. Yeah, the Super Nintendo was a, it was a he heaven for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so so is even the NES. Although, to be truthful, when I, when I first played Dragon Quest as Dragon Warrior, I got it late in the in the in the uh, NES library or in the, the life cycle, and I played. I'm like, my God, this is just a rip off of Final Fantasy. <laughs> like, what the heck? Without realizing it was the yeah. actual opposite. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you know, as a kid, prior to internet, no one knew anything. I was like, well, this is just a rip off. Now I'm like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, anyway. 
this has been fantastic and I'm so excited that we're talking about these things. However, I would like to get back to uh, Final <laughs> Fantasy demo impressions. <laughs> we, we have to get back into the more topical 20 year old game here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to slap you because you're wrong. You're so wrong. This week, the podcast is sponsored by... Koei Tecmo! Lovely listeners, Koei Tecmo's thrilling 1 vs. 1000 franchise is back and better than ever in Warriors Orochi 4 Ultimate, a new Musou action game that features characters from Dynasty Warriors, Samurai warriors and the gods of ancient history joining together in an all-out fight against Odin and swarms of his evil army. All star characters and fan favorites from past Koei Tecmo games like Ryu Hayabusa and Joan of Arc join the ultimate cast, boosting the number of playable characters to a staggering count of 177. Other unique features include the addictive and fun new Infinity Mode, the ability to swap sacred treasures among characters, and the addition of two new endings. Warriors Orochi 4 Ultimate is available right now on the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and digitally on Windows PC via Steam. The new game is available as both a standalone title for those who haven't yet experienced Warriors Orochi 4, or as a special upgrade pack for those who already own the previous game. Thank you, Koei Tecmo. Okay, so back onto likes. Uh, everything in this game is gorgeous. Everything looks like candy. It's very beautiful. The characters, the character models, everyone is the sexiest they've ever been. Like literally everybody is like, just like looking bangable. And that's like <laughs> the way that the artists were told to go. What What are your impressions of their butts? I also really like the effort that has <clears throat> gone into all the posters on the walls. Uh, Barrett's voice is great. I think it's very evocative of how I thought of him when I was younger. Uh, I enjoy that his campy, and ca campy character is still intact. What else do I like? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to go through my notes. <laughs> You're really stretching here, aren't no, you? No, 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 no. I really liked how uh, some of the enemies were reworked. They make total sense in an uh, action JRPG style game like this remake is. Um, mm -hmm. the, the shock troop is flippy floppy all over the place like a ninja. The panther-esque enemy, I forgot its name. Um, it kind of hangs out on the sidelines and then it'll pounce at you. And then when you try and go after it, um, it kind of pulls you away from the action so that way other enemies that have long-range attacks like guns or something they can shoot you so that makes it you know uh, dangerous and you have to think about those strategies in battle and I really like that the sentry gun also um, the sentry gun is uh, set up like in a really high space so you have to switch to Barret and you have to learn how to play Barret to take the sentry guns down I think that that's a very good like show don't tell make the player learn kind of situation hmm um, I also liked the boss, the scorpion boss. I like the structure of that. I think, of course, visually it was super cool with it jumping all over the place and it was hanging on the walls. But it makes you do many different things when you fight it. Like, it's making you identify weak points, uh, notice when you're dealing no damage, pay attention to its attack tells so you know when it's going to whip its tail or shoot guns or shoot uh, rockets. Oh, it has a barrier, so it teaches you about, you know, aiming at different things and breaking down barriers and hiding behind cover, like a bajillion different things. I think it's a really, really well-structured boss fight, and it gets me excited mm. to see more boss fights um, because you have to apply strategy and almost like puzzle-solving skills when you're fighting him. Well, and also on top of that, it introduces this element of actually having to focus on your terrain because as you were saying needing to take cover behind something when the boss is doing its gigantic laser attack yeah um that's something that you couldn't do in the original final fantasy 7 oh yeah. So. yeah yeah they did a really good job of translating like so in final fantasy 7 original uh the scorpion would put his tail up in a really conspicuous way and if you mm -hmm. attacked it at that time, it would counterattack with that kind of laser thing that was really devastating. So you never wanted to attack him when his tail was up. So this is a really good way of translating that into a JRPG or a action RPG. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I also really liked that this actually is one of my highlights for sure. So near the end of the demo, the bomb that you planted on the core, it blows up and it just detonates and it damages the reactor and that's it. Um, it's not a huge, enormous, destructive explosion. It just destroys that one part that Avalanche wanted it to. At least that's my interpretation of that scene. Then mm -hmm. the president of the Shinra company is watching all of this on the surveillance camera. And then he tells Heidegger, the, his like assistant guy, uh, he tells him to, you know, set the sentry guns off. So all the sentry guns in the area start damaging the whole reactor core and the whole uh, mechanism stuff that's down there and destroying themselves, even the other sentry guns. I think that they're going to have uh, narratively have Shinra frame Avalanche for that explosion of the reactor, turning public opinion against them. And then if you know like what comes next in the original game, it's going to make things a little more interesting. So I like that extra layer of like writing that they're putting in there. It gives me hope mm -hmm. for how they're planning on stretching out just one eighth of the game into a full length game. <laughs> now, do you think they're going to sell it in eight parts? Uh, probably. We'll see. Like, cause this is seriously like an eighth of the game. It's not even like one third or anything like that. Yeah. It's, it's early. It's only Midgard. So I'm excited for this scenario writing because of that but I am very worried about the character writing. And that leads me into my dislikes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I said I had a lot of opinions on this. Okay, That's okay. Fine. So some of my dislikes, the, my major ones are with the camera and the combat. So before that, I'm gonna just mention a few smaller ones. So there's some awkwardness and overacting in the physical movements of the character models in some scenes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right Galen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very noticeable with Barrett, and I think the voice acting is good in general for all the characters, and it's very appropriate so far. But I feel like the direction given to the voice actors was maybe missing the mark or something. It comes across as very, like, 90s era awkward animation stuff and, like, awkward dialogue pacing that you would get in English dubs of 90s era anime. And, hmm. and, you know, I'm, like, super fine with, like, cringy, weird, anime-esque, over-the-top stuff. I'm super fine with it. But I think that a lot of this game is giving me the impression that it's going to be rather self-serious. And I just don't know if things are meshing well right now. So we'll have to see. I, uh, I really did not like Barrett's character in this demo. Oh, no? No, it's just, I, I know... I know there's a lot more complexity to the character than what was portrayed. Yeah. But not having, I have not played Final Fantasy VII before. Uh -huh. um, and even, I, the only thing that I have been subjected to is all the hype uh -huh. and everything around it. So I know that Barrett is a complex character. I know the background of what his story is and what he does. But I haven't ever experienced that or experienced those little nuances of what is his personality leading up to those events. Yeah, yeah. And with that in mind, when I was experiencing his personality in this, it was a little grown worthy for me. So for me, like hearing that and knowing what I know and everything, I think that that is a very fair assessment. I think that that is an intended impression on you as a brand new player because... yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a remake. It can change things all it likes, in my opinion. I, it doesn't need to be super close to the original. In this regard with Barrett, it is being really close to the original, in my opinion, because Barrett starts off and he's really gruff and like you're kind of thinking, like, God, this guy sucks. Like, he's an asshole and he doesn't like mm -hmm. you and that kind of stuff. Um, you learn that he puts up this big barrier and that he has, like, you know, a girl that he takes care of and it's his friend's little girl. It's not even his own daughter, but he, you know, refers to her as a daughter, I think, or I don't remember, but he, he basically treats her as the, as such. And there's a whole lot more to his story. So it builds him up as this, and then it breaks him down later on through the narrative. And I, I, I like that. I think that that's really nice story pacing for his character arcs. Hmm. So I, w I will say you are correct. And I think that that is intended. <laughs> Uh, for me, because I know the character, I'm just like thinking like, ah, that Barrett. <laughs> Getting back to the, the controls here, 
I wish I could remap the controls. It's a little bit distracting for me that X is the command menu, not triangle. Yes. And triangle is the button to open item boxes and interact with stuff, not yeah. X. And then square being attack makes sense. I could do it with X as well, but, you know, uh, that's a little unintuitive for me. <laughs> So the demo doesn't have any uh, custom controls, like where you can map the buttons. It does no. not, and Ugh, I'm, I hate games that do that. Yeah, I'm kind of done with that in in modern games. Like, you. Can, I, I'm actually, yeah, I'm in total agreement with you on that. You can just offer that option. Um, you know, I'm not a developer by any means, so I will not pretend like I know what I'm talking about here. However, I will say that I do assume that that is not a crazy thing to program into your options menu to allow. Uh, buttons to be remapped. No, they mm. did that with Luigi's Mansion Three as well, where yeah. I just wanted to invert the, the X axis and the Y axis, and I couldn't, and it was like, oh my god, it was driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah. I was like, why can't I do this? Please let me do it. You know, and especially like, like again, I haven't played the demo, but you just described that triangle, which is the top button, is not the menu, and in most RPGs ever since the Super Nintendo days the top button whatever it may be was your menu yeah always. exactly yeah. and you would think that this <laughs> like... game being a remake would kind of and with it sticking to a lot of the conventions of original final fantasy 7 you would think that they would have done that or at least offer yes. like mm -hmm. classic you know buttons like look at uh, resident evil they have like nine different uh input options for your controls all the time they don't have like fully remappable everything uh that i know of but they do offer a lot of different options hmm it's bad enough that the Switch uses A as the accept button when everyone else uses the X button. So they're in, uh, if you get swap between systems, it's it's terrible. No, I disagree backing. with you, bro. Really? Super you disagree. Like I'm I'm not gonna say necessarily that I like it or not, but I do appreciate them kind of sticking by their guns because they very you know they've always kind of done that. Well, I know that, but what I'm saying is if you just go back and forth, like an Xbox and a PlayStation, it's always the bottom button, which is the X. Uh, at least on the PlayStation, the X, that, that's your accept. But on the, the Switch, it's the right button. Mm -hmm. I would say that kind of screws just like... I know that's the way it is with Japan and all that stuff, but it's just like, ugh. Yeah, so th that's what I was going to say, is that like with the PlayStation in Japan, the accept button is always circle, which is the button on the yep. right. So yeah. that's the same as the Nintendo. And it's always been that way, except for in the West, they changed that yeah. because they would think that X is kind of like X marks the spot. And that's like confirmation in like a Western mindset. So th there is that weird stuff. But I always want to see Nintendo constantly keep except as A. It, it, yeah. it already drives me enough crazy that Xbox uses YXBA, but in different spots, you know? Yes. That, I, I <laughs> yes. can't play games with QuickTime events. I absolutely can't on the Xbox because I'm, yeah. I'm so used to the button layout on a Super Nintendo or a whatever Nintendo mm -hmm. system, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. I'm just saying, like, for the, for, the, for the West, then, just to keep it consistent, it's annoying if you go back and forth between systems because I... I've constantly screwed that up going back and forth. Mm. And I'm sure yeah. other people have too. I, I do agree that I wish that all of them would get consistent. And I just wish that they would yes. all follow Nintendo and Japanese PlayStation. That's fine too. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I, I'm not complaining that it's on the right. I'm just complaining that it's different going back and forth. If they were all on the right, I'd be fine with it too. Yeah, I totally get you. <laughs> totally agreed. And don't forget, Sony of, of Japan specifically stated it's not the X button, it's the cross button. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Super Catholic Irish is also like, no, it is also the cross button. <laughs> so, um, also, this is a big one, and I posted it to my Twitter even. There's stage hazards, which I think is a really unnecessary thing to have in this game. It's almost like they're throwing it in there to, like, you know, have... Uh, gameplay variation which i can appreciate if that was the thought i just don't think it needs to be in this game there were stage hazards there's like lasers and you have to wait for the laser oh to stop. okay that that's what you were talking about yeah. yeah okay oh sorry stage hazard i i didn't know what else to call them uh environmental hazards that's better oh okay gotcha and galen you must have experienced this with barrett running into him uh maybe you didn't notice no, it no actually no. <laughs> Barrett is constantly running into those, dude. That's hilarious. <laughs> constantly. Uh, and it's taking away health. I get it. I thought Cloud was supposed to be the emo one. 
<laughs> I, I get if, like, you know, for the sense of realism or whatever the hell, they want when Barrett bumps into it to be like, oh, oh, and have, you know, the uh, reaction or something. But it should not take away health because you have no control over him. So he's just mm -hmm. running into it and, like, taking off 100, 200 points of health or just something ridiculous. I just, I sat there and watched him continuously walk into it. The, if they can't program the AI, then take away the health damage because that is absolute bullshit. Yeah. To be fair, well, a lot of games are like that. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I think <laughs> any true. game that does do that is BS. And I think that we're all smarter than that. So it should not be in games anymore. Yeah. Agreed. Hmm. Sorry, it was just so frustrating to sit there and watch that and know that I just have to like throw away a potion, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, and it might not have necessarily been the AI on that one. So I actually did run into a laser. Um, it was semi-intentional because I got a little bit too close when I was stopping right in front of That's it. That's not intentional. And That's stupidity. <laughs> and I got hit and I was like, okay, I got hit. And I could see the character taking a step back front, like recoiling from the hit. Yes. And I'm like, okay, so that was my punishment. But then I got hit again and again until I realized, oh, this action of me taking a step back isn't physically correcting it. It's, hey, you're still in this danger area. And that's what I thought was very weird. I'm wondering if like the hitbox area for the lasers are actually wider than what the game was supposed to be. Like, mm. I would have expected that if I had gotten hit, taking a step back would have corrected and said, hey, don't do this again. Not, hey, we're punishing you until you make an action to create correct this. I don't think so. And I'm so. wondering if that is something similar as to what was happening with Barrett on your game, with him constantly running into the laser. No, go to my Twitter, watch that video. It's the dumbest shit ever. It is the AI. <laughs> But also I want to say okay. that I don't think so because I think that the animation of Cloud taking a step back is not to get you in, you know, the safe zone. It's just to have like that reaction of, oh, he hit something and, you know, it's causing damage to him and that kind of thing. It's yeah. it's not thought of any further than that. And I don't think that the lasers are like too generous of a hitbox or something like that. I didn't have that feeling at all. I thought that avoiding the lasers was easy enough um, as annoying as I think it is to just stop and stand there and wait for it to stop moving, and then you have to move ahead. It's yeah. just, oh, that's not fun. It's not fun to play a game like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, it actually just reminds me of that scene from uh, the, fir the first of the Star Wars remakes when they're having a lightsaber fight. I don't remember any of this. Well, no, it's when they're having the lightsaber fight, and then they all get stuck between the laser grids, and they just sit there and just wait. For the lasers to come back up and i know it's supposed to be building suspense but it's like uh, it's really kind of weirdly placed i do not know i feel like this is the War. same thing go to take your money and go see a star war then mm -hmm. <laughs> another this is a small little complaint but it became a huge issue cloud when outside of battle does a single swing with his sword uh when you press the attack button you need to do this because there are boxes that you find throughout uh, the environment that you can break to find small items like a potion or maybe a little bit of an MP heal or something like that. So you need to swing mm -hmm. your sword to hit them. They're always in clumps of boxes together. So sometimes if you swing, you might not hit all of the boxes, which means that you swing and you have to wait for him to put it back. It's only one slash. You can't do a combo or anything like that. So it is a three second. I counted it because it was so frustrating. A three second cooldown between sword swings. And so it got to the point where I would see these boxes. And instead of being like, oh, cool, you know, maybe a potion, maybe a little bit of MP heal that I really need. Instead, I would see them and think, "Ugh, do I really even want to swing at these boxes? And that is not an impression you want to give your players. Mm -hmm. He should be able to do a two swing combo or a three swing combo or something like that out of battle. Even if it's just like too much and they like kind of move around the environment too much, it's fine. That's much better than having this three second cooldown on something that you design into the environment of the game. Mm -hmm. That became a huge issue for me. Well, they do have to pad as much time into the game as filler as they can. So, <sighs> Speaking of filler... What are your thoughts on Jessie, Galen? Honestly, I liked her. Okay. Um, like, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> Barry, do you remember Jessie? 
Yeah, the the Jesse with Biggs and Wedge, they right. were right there in the beginning of the game, and they had very, very minor roles. Yes. And then they were unceremoniously sacrificed, and it was like, oh, look, you're supposed to feel something for these characters that you just met. Yay. <laughs> mm-hmm. So That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> what would you say is your impression of Jesse's personality in the original Final Fantasy game? Honestly... I don't even remember much of a personality on her. Right, right. It, it's been so long, and it was like a nothing character. Like, I wanted them to hang around more. I wanted to get to know them. Yeah. And especially Biggs and Wedge, because at that period in time, Biggs and Wedge was a running theme in yeah. Square games because of Star Wars, Chrono Trigger, and Final Fantasy VI, and now Final Fantasy VII. And then they're just gone, and it was like, oh. Granted, they died in, in six as well, but mm-hmm. at least they... They played more of a part. I wanted to see more. Like I, gotcha. it's it's one of those it's one of those things in video games where you kind of wish you can change the outcome. Like you could do something different to see a what if. Like what if they survive? What would they do? How would they affect the rest of the story? Yeah. Um, but I do kind of wish, like in this remake, having that chance to be able to throw that you know wrench in the in the on you know, the cog and go, ho oh, ho, hold on, you know. We're going to change things up now. What if you can save them? How will it affect the story? Kind of mm-hmm. like a Mass Effect thing mm-hmm. where the story that we all know, we, we played Final Fantasy VII all these years ago, we, knew, we know the story, and the story from A to B, you know, th- those big factors are never going to change, but the way there, you kind of make it your own story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that aspect also really interested me about the, pro- well, the prospect of it about Final Fantasy VII Remake, where it's like, cool, we'll get more characterization out of, like, Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse. You know, three characters I wanted to know more about. Jesse is super awful and annoying in this one. <laughs> well, I, then I guess it's a good thing she dies. I hated her. Galen, you liked her? Could you tell me a little... Before I go into it, um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your impressions with her? Well, it's just I liked the, the annoying honesty of her character. Um... I felt like her character was, how do I put this? It was endearing without asking to be endearing. So ah, I don't know how to me, put this. I was like, it sounds really freaking try hardy and really? awful. Yes. So everything to, to give you, uh, Barry and um, all of our listeners, some context, everything that she says is about how much she wants to bang Cloud. And I hate that. Are you serious? <laughs> Seriously. So in the original, for me, she didn't have much of a personality like none of the three of them did. If anything, she came across as a little bit reserved. And like later on, you figure out she has like, oh, like a nerdy interest in like models or something like that when you were on the train with her later on in the game. Um, and she's talking about, you know, the Midgar, how it how it runs and how the train tracks run. And Mm -hmm. then you kind of get like a very subtle hint of like, oh, maybe she had a crush on you. Um, In this, though, she's just like, hey, Cloud, it's me, girl. And I'm just like, oh, I hate you. See, I didn't get that at all. Everything she said was about like, oh, he's really hot. Oh, he knows just what to say. Hey, I can't believe you're leaving me for the reactor. And I'm like, this isn't a personality trait. Wow. I found it so off-putting and also this really upsets me because like as we know there is a love triangle later on in the game between cloud Aerith, and tifa right so Mm -hmm. if every girl that he meets just wants to bang him then that's going to hinder the appeal and some of the guys yeah is going to hinder (laughs) the appeal that Aerith and tifa both have for cloud and it's just it's not good character writing at all I, I don't know how they can dig themselves out of this one, but... You know, it's funny, too, that they did that. Like, there are RPGs that do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. One that, but pain, you know, plainly comes to mind is, is the, the Trails of series, especially Cold Steel. Okay. Um, but in those games, you actually have romance options. Like, you, you can choose which of the females or men you want to get close to. And uh, so they, they do that. Uh, it's more apparent in the third game because they didn't let you carry over your save. So in the third game, it acts like you romanced everybody. So everybody loves you. Uh. Um, it's, it's, it's really funny. Um, but in this game, you know, the, obviously there's the love triangle, but 
that's all you need. Like you, you don't get a choice. Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, I get to pick which one. Kind of like you know, I can make a Mass Effect or anything like that. It is set in stone as it goes along. And to have a character where everybody is jumping and throwing themselves at them, it just it takes me personally out of the experience because that's not realistic. Yeah, and it, it's like if you're going for absurdity, I can be on board with that a million times over but this is trying to tell also a serious story i know that it's a fantastical Mm -hmm. setting but it is trying to be serious and so when you have something like that it just dilutes cloud's character because oh everybody wants to have sex with him it's just like if you have the the mary sue character or you have the character that's like oh he's so great at singing and he can fight and he's also the coolest and he tells the greatest jokes like it's that kind of thing it's like you're not you're telling me instead of showing me and I just hated Jesse so much in this game. Like I, to be. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say to be fair, and, and some people might hate me for this, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> Cloud really doesn't have much of a character, especially at that point of the game. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He he is is really Zach. I mean, he he's literally so bland of a character. He takes the persona of another character that's right. you know infinitely more interesting than him. Yeah, I think that that's such <laughs> and... a good character twist and such interesting like delayed intentionally character writing i think oh, i hated that twist oh did it you just made him, i made him so bland <laughs> i mean i didn't like cloud you know yeah, don't get well, me wrong yeah, i, I just liked the writing of him and that those decisions that they made creatively i i think it was sad that they they wrote a, they made a character and you're great he was written well but it wasn't him being written it was zach being written right and they they actually made the character the main character that everyone loves so bland that that when they they're like oh crap well we wrote this really interesting character uh in terms of this personality but we gave it to somebody who has no personality let's go ahead and make a game about the other character that we really wrote about which was crisis core which in my opinion was a better game than seven <laughs> with a better story <laughs> and and Cla- zach was an infinitely better character uh-huh. um and it's you know very tragic too especially knowing what happens right, right. but it's but it, it's just funny that like you know they wrote jesse to you know, it's one thing to have a crush. You see a cute guy or you see a cute girl, a crush. Okay, that that's normal. Absolutely, but I could deal with a few of her throwing, comments. Throwing, sure. throwing themselves over somebody with like no personality, like, and you just meet them because because it's like no, that, that's terrible. And especially to an established character, if they wanted to add a new character never heard of before okay fine you shoot in a Jar Jar Binks whatever, but you're <laughs> taking a character that we already know granted just very little bit about but at least she's an established character and changing her fundamentally uh, that's that's not always for the better yeah i think Mm. that she said one thing that was not about how she thought he was cute or like hey you know tifa are you close that kind of stuff yeah i remember that i also Uh. hated that they talked about tifa in the beginning um, not that it has to be the same as the original or anything like that, not at all. But I liked the reveal of Tifa. The very first time you saw her, heard about her, anything, mm-hmm. was when you saw her face to face in that bar, and you as the player are trying to be like, wait, what's going on here? Is this his girlfriend? Wait, this is his. Are they business partner? Like, you know what I mean? It was a really interesting way to introduce Tifa. So. One thing about that is I do want to remind you that this is, in fact, a demo. And I'm wondering how much of this is what we are going to see when the actual game does come out versus, um, like, bits that they've actually switched around story-wise to fit in more, like, nostalgic nods and Easter eggs to the upcoming game. Like, yeah, will we I see mean, that possible. dialogue? Yeah, that that's true. Um, was was the dialogue for like Jesse voiced or was it? Yeah, just everything. Yes. So if they're mm-hmm. gonna go through the trouble of recording voices, um, the odds are they're gonna leave that in the game unless there's a, a huge outcry. Um, yeah. I'm not saying it's 100 percent permanently, but mm-hmm. you're talking about a company that we were just previously talking about how they're going for a surefire thing, break an emergency, you know, because they want money. Um, they're not gonna waste the money recording voices that they're not gonna use. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and okay, so I've got a couple of comments on this. So, one, uh, we actually have seen companies go ahead and use material that is specifically for promotional purposes or for trailer purpose. Um, I'm going to point out, like, the Marvel movies do this all the time to try to convey more uh, personality and tension of a character within a, you know, minute long trailer or so that they can. So, while this is 
voiced and purposefully recorded, I would understand if they actually use this audio clip somewhere else in the game, maybe after the reactor or something like that. Um, Could be, but you're also realize that disney's bank vault versus square enix's bank vault is very very different but and we do know that <laughs> disney and square work together i'm just saying yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah but, let, but let's 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 look let, let's look how much money the infinity war and endgame made back and and uh, final fantasy 7 remake isn't gonna make anywhere close to that amount of money yeah true true um the other point that i wanted to say and one of the reasons why i was kind of surprised that you and i have such a a varying opinion on this Oni is because when she said that bit I did not recognize that as uh, she was hitting on Cloud I recognize that as a storytelling which which part sorry no when, when she was when she was asking a Cloud you know hey do you know Tifa and you know what's your history blah 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 everything like that um, Although you could make that connection, and I understand where you're coming from, I read that more as a storytelling tool for explaining how Cloud is connected to this random group because he has been so aloof and I'm just here for the money, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's more than that. There's more to what he's trying to do. And I actually feel like they are trying to give Cloud a little bit more personality and a little bit more of a character uh, very subtly. Uh, okay. I super, super didn't. But okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with interpreting <laughs> things differently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to say you're wrong. But mm. we'll see when the game comes out if you're wrong. Now, I'm curious okay. I'm, I'm curious about this, uh, Galen, since you didn't play the original, and obviously you're going off of the hype, which is overblown and to epic proportions. Um, mm-hmm. This demo, did this make you want to pick up the quote-unquote full game? And I, I say that just because it's only really a part one. Uh, <laughs> it's or not is really. This, or is this like, <laughs> no, I, I'm going to stay clear. This didn't do it for so, me. So Final Fantasy is one of those games that I've always wanted to uh, dip my toes into. And... I feel like I've kind of missed the train because there's so much momentum to it right now that it's very difficult for me to kind of base my own opinions on the game. You didn't because at this point miss if, the train. You hmm? didn't suplex the doom train, Galen. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's it. That's in six. Anyway, um, I'm talking about the original now. With this remake coming out, that possibility is also there. But with the comments that people are leaving on the internet, the gatekeeping that's actually happening, I'm wondering if that, you know, that potential is still kind of blocked out for me. Because I can go ahead and play this game, and I, I enjoyed the demo. I thought it was fun. I found the, uh, the combat was a unique blend and a good homage to what they tried to do with the original. Um, I actually like what they did with the ATB system. And for those who want to treat this as a hack and slash, you can try it. You're going to have a really hard time and it may open up the, well, I'm interested enough in the story that I want to try to approach this with a little bit more complexity. It's a uh, a gateway drug in the way of JRPGs (laughs) in that sense. Well, it's interesting that you said you missed the train with Final Fantasy now, and I get that if you had to play one to play 15 and understand it but they're all different they're all different worlds with the exception of sequels and like tactics and 12 for example um so you can really jump in anywhere and play any game at any given time Mm -hmm. and just enjoy it because outside of like chocobos and moogles like common elements oh absolutely um, you can absolutely enjoy so why why haven't you played one of the other games or have you well, I, I've played... Yeah, what's your problem, Galen? <laughs> I played Final Explain Fantasy VIII. Fakeness. I played Final Fantasy VIII. That was actually the first Final Fantasy that I beat all the way. Um, I really enjoyed nine. Um, I beat ten. And ten, two, I kind of struggled through, but I got through it. Okay. That game's um, really fun. Ten, it, it two is... has got an awesome battle system. But a terrible yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but kind of going back to Final Fantasy VII specifically, because I did recognize that each game is really its own standalone, which kind of leads into my whole argument beforehand of, hey, if Square wants to come out with a great Final Fantasy game, it needs to not be a numbered. It needs to kind of be separated from its own IP. But 
Well, that's what they did with Bravely Default and like Octopath Traveler. And people well, have really don't enjoyed Lost those Odyssey. games. Yeah. Uh, I have not played Lost Odyssey <gasps> yet. I need to. I know. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> that is that is the real Final Fantasy 13. So here's the thing, though, is that like on the 360 Wii and Xbox generation, I was super busy with like university and stuff, and I just did not game during that entire oh my generation. So I missed a lot of stuff. Yeah. Xenoblade Chronicles 2? Uh, as in also? Uh, no, I did play that one afterwards. I, I played oh, it on God. the Wii. <laughs> um, but going back to the Final Fantasy VII specifically, like, this remake is coming out. There's a lot of hype about this game, but I am going to be playing it knowing that it is a remake. The fact that we know for a fact, oh, hey, the first part that they're coming out with, it's only going to be Midgar. There's so much you're missing. That is going to be in the back of my mind this entire time that I actually play this game. It's not that blind experience. It's not that, hey, I'm discovering what it feels like to have Aerith die the first time. Like, I, that's already been spoiled for me. Like, I know the expectations that are already set up, and I don't know if there's a way to kind of get around that. Uh, what I can do is I can focus on the mechanics and the changes that they've actually made, and that mm. can be my impression of the remake. With that said, though, like, there's a lot of games that are coming out around this time. There's a lot of higher expectations <laughs> that are... He's making excuses right at the end! No, no, no. That's okay. No, no, that's okay. Look, I'm not going to be playing it, so so it's okay. You, yeah. you don't you don't have to play it. I was just curious if it was going to make you interested in playing it, but mm -hmm. yeah, obviously I get that. Other games, I mean, you have to set priorities. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are going to be sitting on this and waiting till part two is released and enjoy the whole thing. Kind of, and that's kind of where I'm at right now. Like, I'll be excited when the game comes out. I love to hear what other more passionate fans' opinions of the game are going to be, but I'm not going to be the one who will pre-order the game and pick it up and play it on midnight and everything like that. I will maybe wait for, you know, three and a half, four weeks for it to drop down in price because it's a AAA right, game right. and that's what happens. Like, right. I'm, I'm not biting at the heels in order to try to get my hands onto this game. But the demo is fun. I want to play it. I just... It didn't make me an avid Final Fantasy VII fan from the demo. I'm wondering, like, when, you know, all of the games are finally out and they have, like, a complete collection on the PS6 mm -hmm. or whatever it's going to be. In 2030, yeah. Uh, later, man. Honestly, later. Because even well, they, if they're... there's rumors of Dirge of Cerberus as well getting a remake now, too. Oh, great. Mm. Cool. That one. Like, <laughs> Turd of Cerberus. See, that's that's really where they lost me with seven. Like it, the the rabid fans are one thing, you know, like the the entitlement. It's it's going to be there forever. Yeah. There are people who will die on the hill that Final Fantasy VII is the greatest game ever. Just like there's people who will die on a hill that Ocarina of Time is the greatest game ever. There's right. nothing wrong with that as long as they're not being toxic. Um, the thing is, is Square has catered to these people, um, and they continue to. And that's where, like, we had this discussion about all these other properties that could come out or, or a great game that doesn't have the Final Fantasy name. Um, and Square will n always come back to these same people. They're, it's like a lifeline. And they don't really make good use of that lifeline. Like I said, I liked Crisis Core. That was the exception. Yeah. But Advent Children was hot garbage. Dirge <laughs> of Cerberus was hot garbage. Mm -hmm. I didn't play before Crisis, but it was a mobile game back in the, oh, in the early right. 2000s. It was pretty crappy from what I understand, but we never got it here. Right. And, and then, of course... You, you have this now, and, and even the, the tech demo, and the, the rage that happened during the tech demo, um, it just, it's it's not stability. Mm -hmm. It's it's literally like, we need something, let's let's throw out, you know, people use sellout. It, it is the ultimate sellout in the video game industry right now. They're so, selling out because they know it's going to sell. So yeah. I just want to make sure, because Dirge of Cerberus is the one where you play as the character in the the red leather coat. Who Vincent, it's a yeah. it's a third person. You use yep. a plethora of different weapons. It came out on the PlayStation Two. That's the one with Dante and Nero, right? <laughs> <laughs> I knew Sorry. I knew this was a bit. A, I could there tell was a lot by of the tone in his voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once once I realized where you were going with it, it's like yeah, lesser lesser devil may cry. Okay, cool. <laughs> but it was it was shoehorned. It was it was all that. It was just catering, 
and and they would continue. I mean, they they tried doing it again with the Final Fantasy 13 bit, and that that failed with you know Agito 13 and Versus 13 and how mm-hmm. they, they changed it up. Yeah. Um, they they get too lofty, and Square Square has these grand ambitions, and they can't follow through with it. They, mm-hmm. they, I don't know. They just Agreed. Kingdom Hearts is a prime example. They could have went Kingdom Hearts one, two, and three and been done with it. But they went Kingdom Hearts one and Chain of Memories and two. Okay, fine. Let's. I'll accept Chain of Memories. It was right there in between. It fit well. But then they go backwards with three, five, eight, and then all these other ones recoded yeah, and three yeah. D and and two point eight. And then even if if you played Kingdom Hearts three, now I don't know if you did Oni or not. No, I, I. I fell off of the boat and drowned, and I was happy about it, honestly. I, I didn't finish 3, but do you know about how they trolled people with 3? No, I can't imagine. When you start the game, you don't start playing Kingdom Hearts 3. You start playing Kingdom Hearts 2.9. Yep. Oh, I was hoping you were going to say Mickey's Circus Masquerade no, or whatever that no, game was on the Super Nintendo. That was a good Hearts game. 2.9. Let's talk about that. <laughs> This has been the Square Enix Everything Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we've been talking about this quite a bit. Um, I I just want to mention some of my uh, combat gripes on this, and then we'll move on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this, I feel strongly about this. Maybe we should change the you. name to the Square Enix Everything Podcast. <laughs> I think that this episode is just going to be called Critiquing Final Fantasy VII Remake. Pretty much. <laughs> But this has been good. Like all three of us have totally different perspectives on this, right? This is mm-hmm. this is great. That's that's what you need. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I haven't even played the demo yet. <laughs> right, right. Well, that that adds to it, though. That helps. And I, I'm honestly not going to. And this conversation didn't help. Honestly, I'll just uh, say that. I'm sorry. Yeah. There are good things about this. I mean, it's a free demo. You should you should give it a shot if you're sitting in front of your PS4. I, I'd someday. rather play Rune Factory Four. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, in battles though, this is actually the reason I want to mention this is because this is my biggest problem with it. Um, in battles, the camera is just never where I want it to be. Mm. I think that the camera is actually focused on the center of Cloud's character model. It's not focused on a little bit ahead of huh. him or a, at the top or anything like that. It always felt off to me and like maybe a little bit too low. And I couldn't help but think about, Barry, I know you're going to back me up on this, Xenoblade Chronicles Cross with all of their camera options. Do you remember mm-hmm. all of the freedom that you were given to be like, you want your camera oh, all the way back? Insane. You want it first person mode? You want it to the left, to the right, whatever. It was all there. So let me ask you a question. I, I, I do agree. Xenoblade Chronicles X definitely had the great camera options. When I play 3D games, I actually, I'm one of those people that I need the camera as far back as possible mm-hmm. because if the camera's too close, like right up the character's butt, like it, it gives me motion sickness because it's zipping around. Yeah, and yeah, Kingdom too. Hearts 3 and Final Fantasy 15 both had A, terrible lock-on systems for 3D combat mm. and B, the camera was all over the place. Like I, That's one of the reasons I stopped Kingdom Hearts 3 because I literally got sick from mm. constantly zipping around back and forth as enemies would come in different angles and and some of those amusement park of moves the one with the the river and your or the teacups and you're constantly spinning and the camera's spinning around you I'm like oh, oh my god. god really it was terrible but does this game like at least the demo does it have a good lock on system does it actually or is the camera like going all over the place and like you're attacking something off screen because the camera's just not showing it or so no to both of those it does not have a good lock on system and oh. the camera isn't swinging around all of the place you are mm-hmm. basically moving the camera mostly yourself at least that's what i found so moving into that outside of battle Clicking in R3, it snaps the camera around uh, to behind Cloud, right? And that kind of... that was the other thing, like the the sorry, the clicking of the R3 and the locking on and everything, linking itself to the the joyce or the joystick button. Was yes, awkward. it was really bad because so that's outside of battle. Is pressing in R3 whips the camera around, resets it to behind Cloud. In battle clicking in r3 locks you onto an enemy it does not snap the camera behind cloud so now you have the same physical function performing two different actions depending on which mode you're in and they perform two you know important functions and um there is actually no functionality in battle 
to do just that, to reposition the camera to right behind your character. To make things worse, when you do click in R3 to lock on to an enemy in battle, it quote unquote resets the camera in a sense, but just to the center, uh, not to the center, but rather to center the frame. I, let me explain that a little bit by saying that it doesn't matter where your character is pointed, whether like Cloud is looking left, looking right, whatever. Um, it just sort of centers the camera from what it's looking at at the time. So it'll do both of those things simultaneously and do them poorly, locking onto a character and centering the camera. So it's extremely disorientating and unsatisfying. You feel like it, and this is the best way I can describe it. It feels like you are playing a third person uh, game in first person camera mode. It feels like you're a fly watching Cloud fight and that's how the camera is operating. That sounds terrible. It that sounds like feels something I will terrible. not want to play. Hmm. It feels really bad. And so like, if it were just that, that camera thing alone, it would be a problem. But my other problem is that the lock-on system is not good. Um, to lock onto an enemy without the camera shifting to them properly, it only shifts a little bit. You are constantly lifting your finger from your right face buttons, which is what you attack with and pull up your command menu, and you're constantly moving the camera with your thumb. So I don't think that the buttons are mapped properly for battle, and I think that this game really needed like months more of play testing and tweaking with the battle system to fix those things. Yeah. Because the camera is a huge hindrance. Well, and I, I imagine that a remapping functionality would not be too hard to implement, considering that you don't have to change a whole lot of programming to it in order to be like, hey, lock-in is now... Even if it's not like custom mapping, you could be like, hey, lock-on can either be R1 or L1, or it can be R3 or L3 or something. Ugh, R3. That's the L3. other thing, too, <laughs> is that L2 and R2 in battle are not what I would say, like, critical functions. They are no. kind of like quick functions to issue a command to your ally, but that is already that function already exists by pressing the X button, which brings up your command menu, and then you just press uh, right on the D-pad, and then you can issue your command to your ally. So L2 and R2 are basically unused, and it's like you're making functions happen, the two functions happen on one button with R3, change it to L th uh, L2 and R2. So what one comment that I want to make about that is that uh, another one of the uh, uh, media people that I listen to, The Completionist, um, he actually had an extended preview of the Final Fantasy demo. It actually extended beyond what we played here and went on yeah, to... Yeah, because he was paid go, to do it, he was publishing the... Go into the, like, the second reactor and so on and so forth. Uh, but he, when he was giving his review on everything and he was talking about the characters, uh, when he came to his impressions on how to play as Tifa, he actually um, associated it a lot with what it would feel like to play a fighting game. And in regards to memorizing your move sets and kind of getting that flow of what your hotkeys are in order to make combat a lot more seamless. So I wonder if in the full version of the game, those L2 and R2 shortcut buttons are going to have a lot more functionality to them for those no who way. want to have a faster play style. No way, because L2 and R2 are those blanket movements of like issue a command to your allies they wouldn't have that not be the function for one character and then be the function for some other characters you know what i mean i thought one of them was a shortcut for hey using your move set if you don't want to go through the menus that's holding l1 so l1 is also okay. not like integral either the only one out of those four top buttons is r1 because that's block honestly the buttons are poorly poorly mapped it's like this is like draft one and I'm yeah. like, why well, is this the demo, not the beta? You know, I, I I don't want to I don't want to critique the L2 and R2 buttons all too much because also we only had a very limited move set and we only had a very limited like selection of what we could possibly select for those hotkeys on there. But here's my problem though is that 
if this is the limited move set and it gets more complex with other characters and stuff like that, that's going to be more problematic because with this limited move set, I already felt like I needed to take my fingers off of the face buttons to move the camera around because the camera was not doing its job. I needed to do the job rather than, you know, make small corrections or something with it. Well, I have a quick question. Um, with the command menu, um, when you pull it up with X in the middle of battle, does it freeze the battle so you can actually sit there and think? or is It, it goes into a slow-mo mode, so there is still movement in the game. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, because you can bring that menu up at any time if you need to be like, okay, I need to think about this. Even if you don't have ATB. Correct. So you can bring it up, you just can't do anything with it. So it gives you a kind of a second to think. You can move the camera around if you want. So that's good, but it just kind of feels like they have their toe dipped in this pond and they're not actually swimming in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, uh, I feel like this is a battle system that still needs to be worked out. There's still some cool things in it. Again, with the scorpion fight, I love that scorpion fight. So I know that there's really cool stuff here. I just think that they need to fine tune what they're doing and really like, instead of... This feels like maybe a couple years worth of them starting and stopping several different times. And then they're like, oh shit, the game is coming out. Pull ideas from every every different direction that we went and just try and make it work. That's what this feels like to me. And it doesn't feel good. And yeah, it's another thing. You know, some people will say, well, this is a demo, but the game is coming soon. And it got delayed even. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it is coming soon. And it's not like... You know, when Demon X Machina did the prototype demo, where it was right. like, this is literally a demo, so we get feedback of Project Octopath Traveler at the time. Um, this is more the demo to get people to buy the game. And and I don't think there's going to be a lot changed, you know, from this demo to the real game. At totally least not agree. the launch <laughs> version. Yeah, the original, ga- or the original full version of the game was supposed to launch last uh, Tuesday on the 3rd. So well, if you want to say originally it was like 2016, but yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, I had that. it. I had it in my calendar as oh, by the way, Final Fantasy comes out on this day. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, th- kind of the final thing I want to say, um, punctuating this is that I've seen some people online saying that you know they were having trouble with it or it was difficult or something like that. I actually found this game to be way too easy. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, if people are hearing my criticisms and they're like, oh, well, he can't do it because he's not good at the game or something. I'm apparently good at the game because I was finding it very easy. I didn't die at all. I wasn't close to dying. I was able to manage all these different things. I like micromanaging lots of different stuff in battle. I like it. I'm saying that the camera... uh, Did you select 20 minutes or 30 minutes for your timer? 20 minutes? Yeah, same here. (laughs) Oh, did you? Did you? Yeah. Uh I can hear the lie in your voice. I had like an extra five minutes to spare. <laughs> but anyway, just it was too easy for me. And I hope that there's a hard mode because I, I like being challenged with that. My only thing is that like this camera has to get fixed. It has mm-hmm. to get fixed and there needs to be mappable controls. I hope that there's a patch or something because. So final impressions. Do you think the demo changed your expectations or changed your opinions of when the game launches? Are you more excited? Are you more worried? I don't know. Um, I'm more worried now because I didn't get to play. Like, okay, here's the thing. I was at E3 and I was at Tokyo Game Show this year. I was so busy. I didn't get to play the damn demo because there was a long line, right? So I was like so excited to play this demo because I was like, yeah, I hear it's all actiony. You know, I've seen plenty of stuff. That's fine. You know, whatever. I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. But then I played it and these huge problems that I've talked about, you know, I'm just like, shit, I'm worried about this game. And I'm worried that like, if this comes out and it's anything less than stellar, are they going to quit in the middle of making all of these games? You know, they're going to release like parts two and three, but not parts seven and nine. And you know what I mean? Like it's, it's worrying. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's a really good question. What if this does come out and it underperforms? I yeah. mean, are they going to pull the plug? I think part one will perform just fine. Part two though, I don't think that they're going to be able to keep the momentum for this long. No, no. Like how are they going to keep doing this and then everyone's gonna be like okay another part of final fantasy came out you know what i mean like how are they gonna keep this even three is too many Uh, two is too many yes two is too many here here's here's something else though is we've been talking about this for far too long but um that's fine that's fine this is the the final fantasy 7 podcast i don't care i feel like with this first one most of the hard work is getting done right now 
they're getting the mechanics down. They're getting the gameplay down. They're getting the the math behind how the characters move and interact and everything like that. From this point on, when they come out with the second, third, whatever, all they're really going to need to focus on are the art aspects, maybe a couple of gameplay mechanics that they would like to add in there in order to make it a fresh new experience compared to the original but the hard work of the actual base coding and how these characters will be moving and acting and how the player interacts with it galen i think that you're underestimating how much work though is still needing to go into it you know what i mean they're not going to be reusing a ton of different things in this game you go to so many different locations no no so absolutely has to get made of from scratch he's saying it's, the groundwork is done yeah, yeah the, but groundwork. I'm saying the groundwork it, you're overestimating how much the groundwork is uh, is going to keep them ahead of the game i don't think it's going to be putting them that far ahead of the game very much at all i well, disagree because we don't know how much they've already started to work on on those next they, parts. They did say the second game isn't going to take as long to come out. Oh. Um, but well, here, I'm wrong on the, the internet. <laughs> you're, you're still you're still get like I feel like collectively gamers are giving Square a very 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 dangerous pass. When when companies started doing DLC and people gave them a pass. Look at what happened. Look at how many companies started abusing that system. DLC mm-hmm. on the disc or nickel and diming you for stupid things. And, and there were even some JRPGs that came out where if you bought all the DLC costumes, it would cost you like four times the price of the actual game mm-hmm. for cosmetic mm-hmm. stuff. Like, it became such a volatile industry. And now we're... G- the, the industry as a whole is going to be giving Square a pass to sell only part of a game at full price and make it a remake, nonetheless, of a game that, that's already been out. It's not like it's a brand new game. You know, games have come out in parts before, um, like Mass Effect, but each chapter of Mass Effect was its own story with a, with a beginning and an end, and they just happened yeah. to connect overarching. It wasn't like you bought... Mass Effect 1 and said, oh, well, now I'm screwed. You finished Mass Effect 1, you were satisfied. You couldn't wait to see what happened next. But, you know, you you had the whole story. You know, when movies do that with a part 1, part 2, um, that's only done because of length. It's it, The whole movie is pretty much shot. They're just in editing. But it's like, we, we're not going to let you sit here for six hours. That's a little much in one yeah. sitting. Mm. And it's acceptable there. But here, here, I don't feel it is. And I feel that if we give Square a pass here... What's to stop other developers to say, well, you know what? We were going to give you, uh, let, let's take Dragon Quest Eleven. That game is a 100-hour epic, awesome story. Mm. What's to say, well, you know what? Instead of paying 60 bucks for 100 hours, what if we cut it in half? And that, that game has three acts. What if we make Act 1 its own game, Act 2 and Act 3, and get 180 hours out of you for 100 hours? That's... That's still not too bad of buck, you know, you know, for, per hour of entertainment. Mm-hmm. And, and that... That's scary. That scares me. That's that, that's not acceptable. Yeah, that that is 100% scary. And I agree with you that I see this as the potential of a dark turn that the industry could be going down. Um, with that being said, I feel like the fact that we're talking about this and the fact that the community as a whole kind of recognizes the BS of, okay, why are you doing a remake of a game and splitting it up and selling each part separately... I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit and say that I don't know that if they could create a full experience with the quality that they are trying to bring up for this game, specifically Final Fantasy VII. And I'm thinking of the length and the amount of data that it would be required to download this game onto a system. Like, those kind of requirements do need to be taken into consideration. Yes, okay, here's Not your on complete... the PS4, though. Like, have you seen some of the installs on some of those games? They're, like, 200 gigs. Exactly, exactly. It's, like, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 gigs. No, but 200, here... man. Okay, 200 gigs on a, you know, 2 terabyte system. So, here is this completed version. Here is all, let's say, 5 parts that we were originally going to be God. doing for Final Fantasy. Each part was going to be, you know, 70, 80 gigs apart. Okay, well, that is half a terabyte right there. That's almost a quarter of what your system could actually hold just to play this one single game. 
I am before that step in the process. I think that that is a failure on the project management of the pro of the game itself. Don't make a game that goddamn big. You know yeah, what I that's mean? Yeah, that's three hundred dollars. Do not increase your your budget and your your requirements on that game so large because then you get it so big that it's like okay, this game needs to sell you know eight million copies to break even that kind of thing. We talked okay. about this before, right? On the on the podcast before, like with Assassin's Creed or something like that, like. God, even Capcom was was uh, and still is um, guilty of that before with a franchise you and I love very much with Resident Evil. Remember, Resident Evil 6 sold pretty well, but they were expecting huge numbers and they put so much money into that project that it was considered a disappointment. Yeah. Well, look at Square with Tomb Raider. The first Tomb Raider yep. wasn't wasn't financially successful until the PS4 and Xbox One versions came out. It right, took right. that long because they, they had so much invested in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, again, the same company. You know, I, I just don't think that we're going to be giving Square a pass as a sense in this. If we make it known that, hey, I personally, I can understand why they would break it up this way for physical limitations. Cause it's not physical limitations. It's not though, physical dude. limitations at like, all. I, I can see what you're trying to do with like the the ideas of like you know well maybe it's this maybe it's that. I I really appreciate you thinking out of the box on that, but bro, it is not that. It, it's not thinking out of the box. It's wanting to try to give them the benefit of the doubt as to justifying their reasoning, other than oh this company is the big bad who wants to go ahead and just make a bunch of money and screw over us gamers. If I mean if, if only the there was a system in place to have changing discs. Maybe a game <laughs> that, that might have used that in the past. Maybe if we remake it and oh use that as a nostalgic God. feature. It's you know too what? big for one Blu-ray. But changing disc. Oh, remember that? Oh, we're going to throw that in here. Oh. Um, it's, it's, it's really at a point where if they do five parts, and I'm not saying they're doing the five parts, but if the, you mentioned five parts. If they do five parts. I use that as an example, yeah. All right. So let's say three parts. If they do three parts, th maybe you won't and I won't and, and Oni won't, but... There will be people out there that are so in love with Final Fantasy VII that they will pay $180 before tax to have all three parts of this game. Mm -hmm. And that, for a remake on a game that you could get right now for, what, 10 bucks, 20 bucks online? Uh, or, or physically even about that price on the PS1. Uh, and there's even a physical Switch version of the game. There's even an updated <laughs> PS4 and Switch version, yes. Yeah. That's like so, 10, 15 yeah, so so you're talking 180 dollars on a game that they are milking. Now I'm not saying that they're not putting money into this game. No, I'm, don't don't get me wrong. They are definitely spending money on this game, but they are milking that fan base even more. They're selling. They're literally, you know, people say like, oh, remaking movies and all your know, constant remakes. All Hollywood's out of ideas. They're literally remaking their own idea and selling it to you piecemeal at full price a piece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they are going to get away with it because people look at this game like it's Jesus walking on water. Like, well, oh my God, that, this is the greatest thing in the world. I don't know if they're going to get away with it. I think we're assuming because it has the power of Final Fantasy, uh, as the, Final Fantasy VII specifically, as a name behind it. But I, but, I, I there's think there's no outcry. I think assuming that they are going to get away with this is it's too early to call. I think it needs to be watched. I think it needs to be What's monitored. The numbers? And if they can come out with an overall product that people can say, you know what? Yeah, it sucks that it was in three parts. It sucks that it took me, you know, five, ten years in order to completely beat this thing. But damn it, I had fun and they did a good job while but putting it all together. Thing, though, Galen, that, like, it's, we don't know how many parts it's going to be. According to Square Enix themselves, they also don't know how many parts it's going to be. At this okay. pace, it's not even going to be three parts. And with each release, they're going to see diminishing returns on sales. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, you, you look I, at other games, too, that have that. <laughs> I mean, Don Hack uh, was, was a four-part game on the PS2. Mm -hmm. and, and the fourth game is worth so much more right now because... You know, mm. it didn't sell. Right, but right. each game was a complete game. Look at Xenosaga. Monolith yeah. Soft wanted that to be six games. They were like, this is going to be a six-game epic. Exactly. And they did the first one, and it sold like crazy. And they did the second, and it didn't sell nearly as well. And then they were told, make the third one the last, wrap up the story quickly, and the third one sold the poorest. Right, right. I was going to say, every subsequent release is going to sell worse than the first release, right. by definition. Because people are buying into this on the hype. 
and they may not who knows when the second game comes out maybe your life is going to be different and you can't put 80 hours into it maybe you have kids or maybe a new job or maybe, maybe you're dead life happens maybe you're dead um so so who knows i mean any <laughs> anything is is truly possible but the reason i say they're getting a pass is because of the the hype the pre-order numbers the people who are so hungry for this game they're willing to pay for it mm -hmm. at full value and maybe even more because this collector's edition so more than sixty dollars um for these special collector's editions and squares known mm -hmm. for expensive ones they already um, have dlc just, plan too like it's just oh, see just to get the game right now and you're not even getting the full game and they're happy with it they're they're literally opening up their mouth letting square spoon feed them garbage and saying please sir can i have some more mm -hmm. and that's what's happening and it's not commenting on the quality of the game or the graphics or anything like that the game could be the uh, a miracle it could be the best game ever you're still going to get it in parts yeah. and you're still paying full price for these parts and that buying that game in parts is telling square this is okay and square may do very well with it they may say you know what each part's taking us two years to develop and we're really making it a, its own thing and maybe they make it feel like a complete game even though we know it's not mm -hmm. but that's just going to send messages to other companies too that will not take the care that will not take that time and will say we can rush out assassin's creed hey you know what? we're putting assassin's creed out every year what if we did it every half a year well every six months another part to the assassin's creed let's right, go for it right. or mm. hey you liked madden well how about every six months we're going to give you another madden with an updated roster even if it hasn't changed we're just going to call it you know 2020 point five mm -hmm. you know whatever who knows and that's so, the dangerous thing so mm. here's the uh, the point that actually you guys made me think of you both have you know very differing points on on whether they're going to get away with it or whatever here's my thing is i think that they need to pull it off in order to get away with it and yeah, so i exactly. don't think that there is any way for them to pull this off because it's set up to fail like you like we said with diminishing uh returns right and mm -hmm. even if they do just three parts and then they re-release it as a collection or something like that, that's the only way that it has a chance at succeeding. But there's no way that they're going to keep hype sustained for 10 years, 20 years oh, absolutely. on one game. They can't pull this off. And so I don't think they're going to get away with it that way. But I do think that this is going to open up the floodgates of people thinking, like you just said, Barry, about, well, what if we did this? What if we did this? Hey, we never thought about exploiting our customers this way. Let's try it out. Don't, don't forget about the inevitable re-release of Part 1, because this is coming out in the PS4, and you know there's going to be a PS5 re-release yep. with enhanced graphics in quotes and all the DLC included oh in quotes. If they put any more particle effects in this game, I'm going to scream. It is too visually <laughs> confusing. Like, I can't tell... Or I can't read the enemy tells because of all the particle effects and stuff. You know, it's beautiful. It looks really beautiful. But that actually confuses the visual language of the game, and it's very difficult. Can you turn those things off? No, I wish you could. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's visually overwhelming for the elderly, like me. Well, I was just joking about the updated visuals, but maybe who knows. But there will be there will be a re-release. Like, oh, absolutely. Know they're gonna, they're That's why gonna I say also it. it's going to be re-released on the PS6 because it's going to take so goddamn long for them to make this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll sell it as a bundle when it's all done. Yeah. And then it'll be like, ah, here you are, 60 bucks for it all. Now the new suckers paid 500 for it and all this stuff. <laughs> and just like with Kingdom Hearts 2.8 birth by 358, the story so far, <laughs> it'll be literally all of those games in one, and it's 20 bucks on eBay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's going to be multiple discs, too, so there will be that change disc happening. Oh, my God. You <laughs> slayed me, Barry, with that. That was the best thing I've heard this entire year. <laughs> Well, I'm very glad I can do that for you. <laughs> That's his royal majesty for you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to some additional DLC. Galen, what is the piece of media that you want to recommend to our lovely listeners this week? So kind of in lieu with the Samurai Jack game coming out, which we talked a little bit about last week. Um... My recommended video is The Evolution and End of Samurai Jack by Super Eyepatch Wolf. Oh, I love Super Eyepatch Wolf. You listen to him too? Uh, yeah, actually. not. I'm rather new as far as like coming across his content, but I really like the style that he presents everything in. 
he's great. Everything is meticulously edited. Mm-hmm. It's very meticulous. It's very uh, clean as far as how he segues everything together. This particular video is great because he ta- he talks about everything from the art style to the expectations of the fans and the history of, you know, the 13 year gap between, you know, seasons uh, four and f- the fifth one that we finally got and the expectations of the stories and everything that people had written in their mind of this wandering samurai versus finally putting an end to that story and just the finality of it. Uh, it's, it's a great watch. I highly recommend it. Lovely. For me, I am recommending a video that came out a bit ago and I, I overlooked it. Don't know how I overlooked it. Mm-hmm. This is called Fatal Frame or How Folklore Brings Horror to Life. This mm-hmm. is a ongoing series by YouTuber Ragnarox. He is a super, super awesome dude. He focuses a lot on horror and this is a series called Monsters of the Week. And he talks in this episode about Fatal Frame, of course, Um, The original trilogy talks about how J-horror is blended into that, how it was such a groundbreaking uh, collection of titles for video Mm -hmm. games. Everybody knows, I'm sure, that I love Fatal Frame to death, so I can highly recommend this. Ragnarok's talks with such passion in his videos. Please check it out. Yeah, I watched the uh, the video, actually, and yeah, it's it's spooky. (laughs) He does a really good job editing it all together. (laughs) He spooks me so good. Yeah, all the good spooks. And then, Barry, do you have something to recommend to our listeners? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, first off, I, I recommend my own stuff. I recommend the Nintendo Fuse podcast and all our content at Nintendo Fuse's YouTube page, including you uh, industry talks, um, where, where I sit down with uh, different developers and talk with them. Our game chats where we do you know different types of reviews. And I definitely still also recommend the Switch Mania Playcast, um, which you can find... Uh, over at HigginsAlley.com. Um, there we do, uh, it's all, all vo- audio like this. We sit down every week and talk different games. And then if you want to go with somebody completely else on YouTube, since that's what you guys are doing, um, there's a channel that I like to watch. Um, it's called the Speakers Network. They do, uh, since we did Final Fantasy, this is a Final Fantasy channel, and they do a bunch of um, videos uh, for Final Fantasy fourteen. Uh, like the Fall and Rise of 14, where it actually goes into the development of the game and why 1.0 was a failure and how it came back, uh, as well as things like Secrets of the Realm and Remnants of a Realm, where they go over like the 1.0 stuff that's still left around and uh, go back to it and show what could have been had the original developer um, kept going. So it's a really informative series, and especially if you like history and Final Fantasy history, um, I think the story of Final Fantasy 14's um, actual real world story is very fascinating. Awesome. I'm definitely checking nice. this out. Checking? Yeah. What? I, I think I've been speaking for so long now, I think my words are starting to fail me. There have been a lot of words this episode. <laughs> <laughs> what are words? They hurt me. <laughs> so now let's move on to the the windiest segment of the podcast. Mm, mm-hmm. That's listener mail. <laughs> uh, that's listener mail. Uh, Galen, since you are fired, uh, where would you send your resume if you wanted to apply to a job on the Nintendo Everything podcast? Uh, go ahead and replace me by sending your resumes to Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. That's right, Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. Soon to be switched over to the Square Everything Pod. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'm writing my email now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and if you wrote us in an email, you might sound a little bit like this applicant. Mm-hmm. This applicant today is Jay. Hey, Jay, how's it going? What up, Jay? <laughs> Hello, Jay. Jay writes in, Hey guys, I'm responding to the call for more emails. I've always got questions. That's the way we like it, Jay. Mm Mm-hmm. I am a big fan of Zelda and Metroid and missed out on Metroid 2 and Link's Awakening because I was a child and I didn't know better. (laughs) With Nintendo's remakes of these two games, I got to play those incredible games with great quality of life updates. I'm also looking forward to Final Fantasy VII Remake because I've never played the original. Oh, 
Have have we got opinions for you then, Jay? <laughs> I, I hope you I hope enjoyed you're this episode. <laughs> Jay asks, is there any game that you missed out on the first time around that you got to play because of a remake? And are there any remakes you think should be done? Also, as a side note, thanks for the advice on the Switch Lite. I ended up grabbing one. Unfortunately, I ended up with a boring gray one because... reasons. It's a little more suited for my travels of work because I'm usually dressed in professional clothes, so it's probably for the best. It's a great handheld, and I love it. As long as you're not going back and forth all the time, it complements having a permanent docked switch really well. Thanks for the content. Keep being awesome and weird. Thank you very much for writing in, Jay. Thank you, Jay. As always, I will Mm -hmm. stay awesome and weird. Galen, you can... I'm just weird. (laughs) know about that there's nothing <laughs> wrong with being weird <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> can i start calling you freaking soundboard barry now <laughs> i don't know great. what do you want to call me <laughs> Yippee. Yahoo. so this is a great great question uh it's actually mm-hmm. uh, a couple of questions it's a set of questions let's uh let's break this up into parts how about that sounds good is there a game that you missed out on the first time that you got to play because of a remake? Galen. I can't really think of any that are striking out at me. A lot of the remakes that I have played are games that I picked the remake up because of that nostalgia connection and wanting to re-experience it. Hmm. Um, like, there's a couple of games that I definitely enjoyed more with the remake uh shadow of the colossus actually comes to mind just because yeah yeah, i loved the music i appreciated the music a lot more the second time than i did the first time but i can't think of any games that i specifically picked up that i did not try at least once beforehand interesting how about you on the same vein as shadow of the colossus i finally actually played eco which you were trying to get me to play for the longest time. And I was like, oh, don't care. Nice. <laughs> Galen likes it. Ale. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm uh, not a real gamer. You shouldn't listen to what I say. Yeah. Uh, that game's great. It's really fun. Um, mm-hmm. So I played that on the PS3 and never played the original. Uh, another game is, of course, Metroid Samus Returns. I never had the Metroid 2 game. And I just never was super interested in in handheld play when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And part of it was that they weren't rentable games at my local game store when I was younger. And I always rented games back then. We didn't buy them. So that was part of it as well. So Metroid Samus Returns, I loved that one. I super loved it. I think that it's actually a little bit too easy. And like the uh, counteract or counteract counterattack mechanic kind of breaks some of the difficulty it makes a little too easy but still had a lot of fun with it mm-hmm. mr barry um honestly uh the game i'm playing right now uh and the games i have been the two of the three games uh rune factory 4 i never played on the 3ds i got mm-hmm. it and i just never got to play it and i've sat down with it now and i'm in love with it and the same tokyo mirage sessions i got that you know when the switch when the wii u came out with it and again just life happened i couldn't play it and by the time i wanted to go back to it the switch had already come out so when it was announced i'm like yes i I get to go back and play it and uh play the switch version with the added content which the you know i don't know if you played the switch version of that um but the they made the battle system even better because they added new session attacks i don't know if you're aware of that Mm. yes (laughs) <laughs> the, you know, Tiki gets in there. Uh, I just played through the the remake on Switch as well. <laughs> oh yeah, so th- there you go. So like they they with those additions, like knowing like oh this like the EX content isn't amazing, but getting those three extra session attacks just made it more fun for me. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I completely spaced. Uh, Resident Evil Two, like I only got very very limited exposure. Oh my god, really... I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Resident Evil 2, the original, man. Uh Uh-huh. I've played it through on Leon's campaign once, but I enjoyed it so much more with all the quality of life updates uh, with the second go-around. And I'm really excited for number three coming out next month. 
I think that happens, uh, you know, a lot with, with a lot of games, especially older on. Like, you know, when, when we're younger, we can't get every system and we, we mm -hmm. miss out. And then when a game goes to other platforms, like like for me, like Sonic Adventure 2, the first time I played it was the GameCube version. You know, I missed it the first time on Dreamcast because I didn't have a Dreamcast at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when the, and granted, that's not really a remake. It's more like an enhanced port. But... I think I think that holds true for a lot of people when a game is a system exclusive for a while and then moves multi-platform, they yeah. get to experience certain games. Well, I think that brings up a good point. I I would much, I would very much appreciate to see more remakes coming out as opposed to uh, remastered. So something like Shadow of the Colossus and Ico, like you were just mentioning, Oni. Um, I would consider that more of a remastering of the game because they didn't really do much to update the game or change up the way that it feels. Mm -hmm. It's really just the graphics and maybe a couple of subtle like tweaks here and there. The one though on PS4 of Shadow of the Colossus. That was a remake. Yeah, that was ground up remake. Like I know oh, that yeah. like the structure didn't change, but I mean they they put full on effort into that game. Yeah. Yeah. That's what has me so excited about Xenoblade Chronicles uh, on the Switch because it is a remake. They're remaking that from the ground up, mm -hmm. and new engine, everything. And is it I'm a new so engine? Excited. Yes, brand new. They're they're doing it from the ground up. They're using the, the Xenoblade Chronicles two uh, engine. Really? That's, I didn't know that why, we knew this. Yeah, that's that's why the characters are completely different and all that. So they're rebuilding the game with that engine instead, and that's why I'm so excited because so many people slept on that game and didn't get it because it was on the Wii. Yeah. And, that game is amazing. Actually, yeah. our our uh, writer inner what what the hell is this? Our listener, uh, <laughs> Jay, he is a fellow Xenoblade kindred spirit, so oh. he is super excited about the uh, definitive edition also coming out. Uh, he wrote into us before, I think it was Jay, who asked about uh, what you know updates do we want to see in the definitive edition. Yeah, well, Jay, then you are a kindred spirit. Xenoblade Chronicles was my game of the generation. <laughs> of that. Yeah. I uh, love that game. Um, and then his other question that he has here. Yeah, his other question of, are there any remakes you think should be done? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually got two, but I'm kind of interested to hear your two first. So. No, no, no. You, you first, Galen. Okay. That um, way I can tear them down. Oh, my God. <laughs> So the first game that I would love to see a full-on remake of is the Mega Man Legends series, specifically the first one. Oh, yeah. Good choice. Good choice. Great um, choice. I think the game was absolutely fantastic. I love what they did with Mega Man, um, but there were definitely some huge problems. Like, that was at the beginning where of the PlayStation era where they were still trying to figure out how to make movement within a 3D environment a thing. So like controlling the cameras with the L and R buttons as opposed to a dedicated, you know, analog stick, which back then they didn't even have, depending on which controller you had. Right. Um, you, there are definitely a lot of quality of life movements that can make that game a little bit more fast paced, a little bit more involved, but still retain the spirit of dive into dungeons, explore around you know, grind out to get some new stuff and kick cans. <laughs> um, but the other game I would love to see a remake of is the White Knight Chronicles series. Um, I, I, I feel like that was a missed opportunity. I really enjoyed it and kind of was thwarted by my own efforts on that one because I got so in... It's the exact same thing that happened with Fire Emblem. I got so invested with the aspect of leveling up my weapons and grinding just to make that work <laughs> that I forgot to actually make progress in the story and just fell out of interest because the game. I thought that the game loop couldn't supersede that in any way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is my Achilles heel for most RPGs. So. I will say that I think that the story was not very strong in White Knight Chronicles 2. And that's why I mm -hmm. fell off of that real hard because I liked number one. Yeah, I think that might also be added to your to your your recipe. If I remember correctly, I really like that in number two. You can customize your own giant robot that you jumped into and fought monsters with. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but, great, but those are my two choice. games. Yeah, <laughs> both of them. Uh, Barry, how about you? I have three. Ooh. I have three. So the first one is um, 
Staying with the Square Enix motif, and that is the seventh saga from the Super Nintendo days. Oh, nice, nice. freaking choice, man. That, okay. that is just one of those RPGs that got very overlooked. It's not an expensive game, but it is truly fantastic. Great use of Mode 7. The fact that you get to choose which characters you want to bring with you. And, and I just feel like there was just so much to that game. And it was it was honestly ahead of its time, and I feel Absolutely. that if that game got a remake now, it would be phenomenal. So that's my first choice. That's excellent. second choice would be kind of a, a I guess it would have to be a collection mainly, uh, and that would be the Gargoyles Quest games from Capcom. One Isn't and Gargoyles two. like the animated series Gargoyles? No, no, it's Firebrand. <laughs> it's a spinoff from oh, uh, oh from Capcom. Uh, Ghouls and Ghosts. Capcom. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, if you never played them, you really should. Um, Gargoyles Quest 1 was a Game Boy game. Gargoyles Quest 2 was a Game Boy game, I think, in Japan, but which was different than the NES version that we got. And then Demon's Crest, which is on the Super Nintendo and also on the SNES Online on the Switch. Yeah, um, yeah. All fantastic, fantastic games. And I would love to see their, you know, their little adventure, old-school Metroid style or old-school Castlevania kind of style, not, not necessarily Metroidvania. Um, Demon's Crest is more Metroidvania, but it's it just had a great story. It took an enemy from one game and made him a protagonist. Yeah. And it definitely has a cult following. The fact that Firebrand came back in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite says something. Right. He is just a really cool character. Those, uh, I, those games do not get an, enough love. And uh, if you haven't played them, you should. And if, if Capcom is listening, it would be awesome if they remade them and maybe put out a proper sequel. Um, but those games are great. And the last one is, is easy for me. It's a game I've wanted forever, which is pretty ironic considering the entire conversation that's been on here, um, this whole podcast, which is Final Fantasy VI. Um, oh, I think okay. six, is, well, six, is, six is one of my favorite of, this, of the whole series um, outside of, of 11 and 14 for, for different reasons. Uh, six, I think, has just the, the greatest story, and to this day can bring me to tears all i have to think about is doma castle and i start crying like mm -hmm. to me that was probably the most emotional scene in any video game i think i've ever witnessed mm -hmm. and it is just such a powerful game there's so much there and this the thing is, is so many people don't want to go back they're like oh i started with seven or i started with eight or even nine and i'm not going back to the older 16 bit or 8 bit or you know final fantasies i don't want to yeah. go back there. oh it's and it's <laughs> sad it really is sad they don't even want to give them a chance and the, you know i have a friend of mine back in the day like how can you know sprites evoke emotion i'm like really you need to play this game and, and it's true. And if that got the treatment that Final Fantasy VII is, is getting, I would be overjoyed, especially seeing like Locke and Terra and Dissidia and T and how they looked. Like, yeah. oh my God, um, mm -hmm. that'd be amazing. But I would not want it in parts. <laughs> <Hold> <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting to me because my wife is the exact same way when it comes to Final Fantasy games. Like she feels that Final Fantasy VII is a little bit overhyped compared to the greatness that is the story of Final Fantasy VI. That is amazing. Did you play um, VI? I have not. I, I actually never had a Super Nintendo when I was growing up. My parents got me a Sega, so... <laughs> it, it's, it's not really a spoiler because there's nothing you could really do in this scene. Um, but the Doma scene, pretty much... You know the character Kefka, the villain? Uh, yeah, he's yeah, pretty yeah. Blown up. Kefka wants Doma to, to side with him. And the, the leader refuses. He, we're not siding, we're staying neutral. So he poisons the water supply to the entire castle. And people are dying left and right. And Cyan, the leader, is a playable character, fantastic character. But you see him holding his wife and baby who drank the water and die in his arms. That is some, like, Game of Thrones level and it's of just, like... like Yes. What the wow. crap? <laughs> like, and this is a Super Nintendo game. Like, this is this is why, like, I'm like, oh, this Final Fantasy told some really adult stories. There's that yeah. scene in six as well with Celis where she's at her lowest point and she's yep. so in despair she jumps off of a cliff to kill herself. Yup. Yup. And and well, even more so if if she if she kills Sid, right? Because you can right. kill Sid or worse. keep him alive. <laughs> Um, yeah, like there's so much to that game and there's so many levels of depth that I, I think a lot of people are doing a disservice to themselves for not experiencing it because it really is 
a pinnacle of storytelling. And it, while it doesn't have the one main character and it does have a, a very robust, a large cast of characters, um, they each have a great story to tell. And I think they could do so much justice with, yeah. with an updated visuals and updated storytelling for sure. Nice. Really excellent selections, and I'm so excited to talk about video games. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Oni, what are you? <laughs> okay, so for me, I was trying to think about, like, some squandered potential, right? Now, lately I've been playing Breath of Fire 2 on mm-hmm. Super Nintendo Switch app thingy. And All right. I love the story in this game. I love the characters in this game. I love the world and uh, how there's so many different clans and... It just the world feels like a world with different kinds of people and races in it. And I think that the story of Breath of Fire 2 could be, you know, so heavy in certain parts. It deals with like a religious cult that's very Catholic that is trying to destroy the world. And this is a story that needs to get retold and the battle system needs to get reworked. There's a lot of things that need changing. For example, your magic fighters are not very strong. Um, except for maybe Nina and Blue. The other ones are just kind of, like, useless. And, I mean, there's bugs in it, so that way, like, the when you cast attack down or improve your attack, um, you know, sometimes that fails. The agility stat is completely bugged. There's so much stuff that they could do with modern RPG uh, elements that we're even seeing in things like Trials of Mana that I think have a whole like playing field for them to try out they they even had in like uh environmental exploring they had things like okay this character can hunt with her staff and this character can reach over long uh gaps that you normally can't get across with his really long arms because he's a monkey and so on and so forth there was so much different stuff like that that it always felt like oh cool i got a new character i could explore a new area like what else can i do with this character hmm I'm going to put this out. I thought of another one. I want you to say yours first, but I'm wondering if we're going to have the same one. So. Uh, probably not. So Okay, what what is yours? My other one is a late PS1 game called Vagrant Story. It was not the same one. Yeah. Uh, another good one. <laughs> uh, the, the writing in this game is incredible. Like, the people that translated this and localized it, uh, absolutely incredible job. This is just a game that was aiming too far above what could be done with that hardware it's a great game with a lot of flaws and it's set Mm. in evilise as well which is the final fantasy tactics final fantasy 12 uh, yeah final fantasy tactics might be a good one to do a remake on too well kind of got a psp re-release yeah yeah just an updated (laughs) port would be enough for me okay okay what what were you gonna say galen so the the one that I just thought of that I think would be fantastic to see nowadays is uh, Eternal Darkness. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, can you... With the way that gaming has changed nowadays, can you imagine if you are playing through a third-person perspective, like Resident Evil 2-style version of that game, and then all of a sudden it goes to your dashboard, and it says that your internet's not connected? <laughs> right, right. I mean, there's so much stuff you could do even with, like, the Joy-Con or the, the whatever that you're playing that just like, mm-hmm. feel different or feel awful. Use the 3D rumble. Screw with you. Like, it goes to the home menu on you, and then it says, like, oh, your controllers are disconnected, but you're getting, like, f***ed up from, like, an enemy or something like that. Like, there's so much stuff you could do. Or, you know what? Get some cross-promotional, like, um... Uh, things going on with Nintendo's IP. Like, all of a sudden you go into a room and there's a Metroid that's starting to float around and start to attack you, but (laughs) only if your insanity gets high enough and it's just an insanity moment. What if it just go into a room and suddenly, like, you're playing Breath of the Wild? (laughs) (laughs) Like, what what the heck? Yes! That would be fantastic! (laughs) I think my ideal sanity effect in that vein would be you walk into a door and it's just Wario and he eats you. (laughs) <laughs> or what about if it's just Waluigi and just hits you over the head with his, you know, tennis racket? Like no, that. it's he's just assist. Waluigi and he's wearing nothing. <laughs> and he's doing the dance from the tennis game. <laughs> or what if you start just automatically moving to the left and you think you have Joy-Con drift and then you realize oh, that, that would the be nightmare the is real! <laughs> that would be the best one! 
You you could go into a room and see the E3 presentation for Wii Music with the drummer. <laughs> I would go insane just to see that. <laughs> oh, oh, they could really troll. Walk into a room and there's like Mother 3. And it's like, yes, it exists. Like, haha, no insanity effect. You're not getting it. Right, right. Like you walk up to an arcade cab or something in the game <laughs> yeah. and it's like, you can start to play Mother 3. Yeah, it's like... You open up a door and it's just two Japanese businessmen holding the Wiimote yeah. and just yes. like, we would like to play. <laughs> they can totally go meta with it. Sure. I think they should. That would be fantastic. That would, walk, you walk into an episode of Captain N. <laughs> you know, just, just take or it. Or Captain Rainbow. It. What was that guy on, on the Wii? Yeah, Captain Rainbow. Captain right. Rainbow. It just goes into a new episode of Nintendo Direct. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's so funny, too, that you, you mentioned Breath of Fire 2, and Galen, you, that made you think of Eternal Darkness. And when he was mentioning yeah. that, to me, it made me think of Grandia 2, which is oh. one of my favorite RPGs ever that, I, again, could also use a, a great remake. I don't know if you played that one or not. Yeah. Have you played the remaster? Well, not the, the PS2 version was a demaster, really. Oh, the, the remaster. Oh, there's the one on Switch, Switch yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that game is amazing, and it, it has a lot of similar story elements as Breath of Fire 2. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it does. The, actually, oh, you're literally the only person I've ever talked to that has talked about the connection between those two games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so happy right now. Well, I'm glad. Jay, thank you for writing into us and creating this magical moment. Thank you so you, much, Jay. Jay. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> if you, dear listener, would like to write in and create more magical moments and also create words that we have to speak out of our faces, usually Galen, mm -hmm. please write into us at nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com. Barry, uh, since you are sending in your resume, would, would you like to give a shot at telling where the listeners to come into? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he already said it. Yeah, don't put him on the spot, Galen. What? Why have I never thought about doing that? Like, you already say it all the time. Why do I always repeat you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, what do you want me to do? You opened up so said. many eyes for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 if someone wanted to know that email address, they, they probably would have either written it down or could pause and rewind just a little bit. We, we live in this magical age where people can stop and rewind. <laughs> there is literally a link down below. <laughs> no, or push the link down below. You You're can't see me, but I'm pointing it at it. <laughs> Uh, Nintendo everything pot at gmail.com <laughs> <laughs> so what is coming up what is coming out on Nintendo everything.com we have again way more coverage and way more translations on Miyamoto coming out of the gigantic Famitsu interview recently plus all the news we didn't talk about today <laughs> shut up <laughs> <laughs> we totally didn't get derailed <laughs> we also have some interviews coming up and more lovely content that you just don't want to miss. Stay tuned to NintendoEverything.com 24-7 for all your updates right when they go live. Our news team works super hard. Stay connected to us also on our Twitter. That's at NinEverything. And we have the YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash NinEverything. And for me, my Twitter, if you want to tell me that my opinions are wrong and that I cannot criticize... Final Fantasy VII Remake. My Twitter is at Oni underscore Dino. I also do the Twitter. No, not the Twitter. The, the Instagram. Sometimes. Oni <laughs> underscore underscore Dino for the Instagram. Galen? If you would like to confirm that my opinions are wrong on the internet about Final Fantasy VII and that I have no right to even play it, uh, you can do that on Twitter at Mobius087. And yeah, um, I got a haircut, so I might post a picture on my Instagram at true underscore Mobius. So, hey. <laughs> and our lovely, lovely guest of honor, his his highness himself, whatever we called you in the beginning, mm -hmm. Barry. Your majesty. <laughs> <laughs> Your majesty, huh? 
Um, so yes, if you want to tell me that, you know what, I sucked and I should never come back, um, you can tell me on Twitter at Hawk Hellfire. If you do like listening to me and, and my opinions, um, you're more than welcome to join me at the Nintendo Fuse podcast. You can see that at YouTube, uh, at uh, youtube.com slash Nintendo Fuse. We do our podcast live, so you actually get to see us screw up live. Um, we do that every other Tuesday at 8.30 p.m., eastern standard time so our next podcast is actually going to be tuesday march the 17th um, you can also catch me on the switch mania playcast you can catch that at hagensalley.com and there's a link there at the top for the switch mania playcast so thank you very much barry it was an absolute pleasure having you here the pleasure was all mine are you kidding me this is great we went off the rails talked about everything that we wanted to <laughs> this episode this episode did not go the way that I was expecting it to and I'm very happy for that. Well, good. <laughs> you are welcome back anytime, Barry. There there will always be a spot for you, your majesty. <laughs> <laughs> See, and what's funny is you know, before we recorded this, you know, Galen expected me and Oni to team up on him, but I think I was pretty neutral there. I think I sided with both of you equally. Yeah, you yeah. you took a few pot shots at both of us, I would say. Mm-hmm. Which is which is fun. This way, has someone has to be an equalizer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, o- Oni does not get nearly enough when it comes to that. So, <laughs> well, well, I will say this. You know, o- Oni Oni was a guest on on our podcast, and it was an absolute pleasure having him there. And uh, you know, we we actually stayed for an extra hour and a half and and just talked after the the podcast that finished airing. And and it was awesome. it was fantastic, and uh, just. Oni, Oni is a pleasure to, to talk with. And now that I got the actual pleasure of finally talking with you, as opposed to just listening to you when I listen to your podcast, Galen, you I regret it every moment of it. I do not. I was going <laughs> to, you know, I was going to say that it, it's been an absolute pleasure as well, because, you know, the dynamic you guys have is awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. That's so very kind of you. I'm sure the listeners agree with me <laughs> or they're sending me hate mail right now. How dare you compliment them? <laughs> <laughs> Galen, let's end this on a positive note. What is some Alrighty. life advice that you're going to leave people with? My little pearl of wisdom, if you will, that I spread to every one of the listeners is take time to go play video games. They're really good. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing listening? No, I'm not going to tell people to stop listening to the podcast. No, don't do that. I th- Look, it's like three hours in. I think you can tell them to stop listening to the podcast If you guys <laughs> sat here and you listened to this whole thing in one go, you are the truest of truest. Even if they listen to it in parts, they're still awesome. Anyone who listens to this is awesome. That's actually the secret. Ain't nobody else know. I am enlightened today. da 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 So be sure to listen to us again next week. And for everything Nintendo, stay tuned to Nintendo Everything. Bye-bye. I'm still waiting from that poo joke.